what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast. I'm here with my good friend, Monica Simons. Got it right. <laughs> <laughs> she is a double major. She is both English and environmental science uh, from Colleen, Texas, but a military kiddo. So she's been all over the place. And she is here to talk with us about college, life, the universe, society, and everything in between. So without further ado, we're just going to go ahead and get started. What's going on, girl? Um, I'm, I'm alive. That's, You're alive. That's just kind of how I always answer that question is I am still living, breathing, and existing. Nice. That's a good start. <laughs> that's a really good start. That's, that's the consensus. <laughs> <laughs> Naba, what's going on with school? Because we have a class together that's been going interesting the past week. <laughs> Honestly, most of the time, by, like, by the time I leave that class, I, all of it is just dumped out of my brain and I... I just move on with my life. I, yeah. It's just it's just discussions that uh, don't necessarily click with me, but I know that I have to be a part of for some reason. <laughs> and that, that that's what that's what the uh, university tells me I gotta do, so I'm, I'm just gonna do it. <laughs> right. Well, it makes it easier that there are only nine people in the class. And so if it was 26, well, maybe it would be easier with 26 people because then you could kind of hide in the mm -hmm. circle when everybody's discussing and just keep all your opinions to yourself but what fun yeah. would that be um i think that with nine people it can either go really well or really badly and the trick is to make sure those nine people get along because if they didn't then it's in incredibly stressful <laughs> yeah well we get along we we definitely do I yeah, think on occasion I suppose. yeah yeah <laughs> well it's been interesting and i think i almost liked it better at the beginning of the semester when matt was leading more of the discussions because mm -hmm. it was much more around the circle and around the table as opposed to this kind of hierarchical somebody's presenting and we're kind of evaluating the presentation while we're trying to have a discussion in a way you know and that that's just maybe a thing that i do in my mind because i'm always thinking okay does this person know what they're talking about mm -hmm. are they getting it on the ball you know are we going to be able to talk about this or is it just going to kind of fall flat on Whatever. I mean, I, I don't really sit there and evaluate yeah. what they're saying in the presentation. I just, I, I have a very terrible attention, so I struggle to focus on things. Um, so half my mind is elsewhere, but generally I just, I just kind of listen to what they have to say and, you know, take it with a grain of salt. And I have, if I have something to say, I say it, but I personally don't sit and evaluate because I have no reason to, honestly. Yeah. What's been your favorite part of the class so far? Honestly, the friends. Yeah. Um, just like, it's interesting how the clique has formed where we have Maddie and, um, oh, not, not Julia. Um, Hannah. Hannah off to the side. And then Mustafa is kind of in the front kind of center. There. Uh, Julia, she, she's like a satellite. And then there's like the rest of us hanging out here in, in a cluster. Um, so it was just, for me at least, it was very fascinating to watch how all that formed up. Um, and kind of maintain itself through the semester. Mm -hmm. I give a lot of credit to Gina and Gianna from the very beginning because they're just social butterflies and mm -hmm. we're inviting literally everybody into the circle. And I remember yes. the very first day, I thought we might have been in the wrong room because there were only nine people in the class. Yeah. And it's a 400 level class. It's pretty discussion based. So I'm thinking to myself, oh gosh, I'm going to have to talk. Yeah, I mean, I knew that the class would be small because when I went into the um, advisor for figuring out my schedule, I, I needed an elective um, from from that for that particular slot in the in the degree, and um, he said he was trying to get enough students for this particular class, and I'm like, okay, I'll I'll take it. Why not? You know, I, I need I need the elective, so um, I, I I knew it would be a smaller class. Yeah, it's good. It's got its pros and cons, but mm -hmm. beyond that, beyond the pleasantries of um, that, and I'm sure we'll kind of go back to some of the discussions we've had in class, but you are also, aside from being an English major, you consider yourself a STEMI yes. at heart. Explain some of that for me. Um, a lot of that comes from the fact that I've been taking college level courses since my junior year of high school, and I was in this program called TBI, uh, Texas Bioscience Institute, and it was a middle college program where um, for half the day we would hang out at the high school and do electives and then get bussed off campus to um, the local college to take these um, classes. And most of them were, I'd say I took classes in microbiology, biotechnology, biology, chemistry, all with labs. 
um, and also took a bunch of maths and obviously my English composition courses, but I always enjoyed um, the science. It was, I was always good at biological sciences. Um, and I, I just, I was really interested in them and it just kind of stuck with me through up until now. Um, and I knew from the get go that I wanted some sort of science degree. Like I was very passionate about that. I don't know why it's just one of those things. Um, and I, I was just very driven to, you know, go into something in that field. Yeah. What is it about environmental science in particular that kind of brings you back in, into that field, into that arena? Um, well, you have subjects like ecology, you have biology, you have um, biogeography, and you talk a lot about ecosystems and species and how all these things interact with each other. Um, and I, I just enjoy learning about all the different connections and learning about how, you know, species fit together. It's like a big, big puzzle, big web. And I, I just, I just enjoy that a lot. I don't, I don't have a particular reason why. Um, I just, I find it interesting. Um, even when I was a little girl, I was interested in all sorts of things like anatomy. I was interested in, um, astronomy. Uh, I was interested in like, you know, just all sorts of random stuff. So I think that's kind of where the desire to be multidisciplinary comes from as well. Is like, there's so much out there. How can you possibly limit to one thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we were, we were kind of having a multidisciplinary discussion earlier today even, mm -hmm. and we're going to try to maybe either continue that or restart <laughs> it, it. <laughs> maybe recreate it because it was really good. I actually enjoyed it yeah, a lot. I, it was frustrating because like I, I am not always good at explaining things because um, a lot of my wiring with how I view topics and, and different lines of thought is all crossed together and whatnot that get, it, it's difficult to get it all out. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> we are, all right, I'm trying to recreate it again in my mind. We were talking about how science, there's a difference between research science mm -hmm. and what you would call practical science, yes. where there's a difference between those who would go into a lab and be, be researching and be looking up, and, and I guess you were, keep referring to this body of knowledge, and then mm -hmm. there are people who go out and from those experiments kind of communicate that to the public and how there's really a crisis within science of we have a bunch of really smart people doing work and nobody knows how to make that information known to lay people. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, um, it's really fascinating because in all, a lot of my science classes, um, there's just this uh, sort of dialogue going on where, you know, you have to know how to communicate with the public. It is imperative that you learn how to write and communicate and stuff. But it's still, the idea and that dialogue is still in, in its infancy, infancy. So, you know, everyone's trying to figure out, well, we need to do, we need to do the thing, but we need to figure out how to do the thing. And I think out of all of them, the engineering majors have it the worst because I, they, they do, they're so, they're so intelligent, but the communication is just, it's so bad. I, I was actually an engineering major my freshman year and just trying to communicate with people was impossible because everyone had these wonderful ideas, but they didn't know how to break it down to other people's level and, you know, get it all together. It yeah. was, it's incredibly frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were talking also about how, I mean, they give, the university gives engineering students a technical writing class that's specifically mm -hmm. geared towards their major and towards yes. engineering because, I mean, it's no mystery that, I mean, people in the science field have kind of been, you know, so tunnel focused on that body of knowledge, that mm -hmm. body of scientific knowledge for a while, which is great. I mean, you know, center on what you're truly majoring in. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. But then we kind of have reached this point where there's such a gap between what we know and what we can explain, Right. you know, and you'll be giving, the university will be giving all these engineering students. We've got what? 2,500, they're aiming for 20, no, they're aiming for 25,000 yeah. engineering majors, yeah. these technical writing courses, but how many of them, for one, take them seriously when they're taking them, mm -hmm. two, after the fact, kind of retain that information and have a desire to communicate effectively in the right. future and to retain that knowledge? I actually took, um, when I took my technical writing class, it was through the chemical engineering department, and it was... <sighs> It was difficult and very stressful because there's 
a lot of social rules and stipulations and stuff. So when you have different kinds of communications, like um, a business email or a memo or whatever, they each have their own format, their own rules, their own expectations. And it's this whole professional culture that you have to learn to be a part of. But then, then again, I've only had that one class to explore that. The rest of these classes, it's like, here, write, write this essay or, or try and give this presentation, you know. Mm. Um, but I will say that in, in that chemical engineering, the technical writing, I that was the hardest presentation I ever had to give because everything had to be so painfully precise that it was ridiculous. And it's like, no wonder, you know, engineering and science majors have trouble communicating because there's such this rigidity and this um people are so far removed from organic conversation just talking to people on their level you know and there's all this jargon and the and these rules and these expectations that it, it's very difficult to get on the same playing field mm -hmm. and i think that also extends into just academia in general mm -hmm. um for one i mean that's kind of the purpose of academia if you're in academia you show yourself um, among the ivory towers by yes. your extremely elevated language. You're so, um, maybe not eloquent, but just you've got SAT words out the frickin' wazoo. Um, yeah. Just $5, $10, $20 words every single sentence, every single page, the articles we have to read for class. Mm -hmm. Some of the times I'm just literally calling through information for one, because of time, but also because if I don't know or quite understand a sentence in the original context, I'm not going to understand it in 10 minutes. So I just find stuff that I understand mm -hmm. and then work my way backwards from there. Yeah, I, I do that too. Um, the It's almost like a code. It uh, is. It's just like this whole other language where, you know, you're, you're supposed to be elevated to show your professionalism. And it, it's, it's like this secret club. And it's very hard for outsiders to get access to that club. Mm -hmm. Uh, so. How do you think we mitigate that? Um, honestly, just a lot of it comes down to the vocabulary. Like, not everyone's gonna understand what poly, like what polypeptide is, and not everybody's gonna <laughs> understand what these twenty dollars words are. And you know, not you gotta learn how to take these concepts and put them into a common vocabulary where you know most people can understand it. Um, but then you get, you run into an issue of education level. So, you know, a high school education is going to be different from a community college education, which is different from a, um, college level education. And how do you f work out a common ground of language across all of that to communicate with as many people as possible? And that's very difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the difference between communicating to the masses and communicating to your fellow members of exactly. the ivory towers, mm -hmm. which is interesting to me because it seems like a lot of the stuff that we're reading is not meant to be read by us. It's meant to be read by peers and scholars getting medals and publications and reviews, which cool, good on you, congratulations. But if your real purpose here is to entertain and to inform and to educate people around you and to make the world overall a better place and you know, progressive and moving forward, then I think we need to do a much better job of figuring out some balance point where um, we can be smart, we can be um, discovering, and we can keep moving forward, but also do so in a way that doesn't leave people behind, mm -hmm. that doesn't leave the vast majority of citizens, I mean, American or otherwise kind of in the dust in a way. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that's exactly happening on a practical level. It's not like there's some super elite society that's just derailing from the general population, unless you believe some conspiracy theories on that, but I don't know. Illuminati. No, really, but <laughs> but yeah, it, it's frustrating to me because I think that also encompasses a lot of different uh, areas. So I go to church here, mm -hmm. and there's a certain way that Christians speak or religious people speak about yeah. things, and you and you can hear it. You know, especially here on campus in College mm -hmm. Station, you can hear when somebody goes to breakaway, when somebody goes to church all the frickin' time because they just talk about life differently. And some of that's cool. You have these different words and you can code switch back and forth into mm -hmm. what you, you understand. But it becomes so exclusive that people on the outside looking in are thinking, I must not be welcome here. There's a language barrier yeah. literally between you and I. And if I can't assimilate your language, if I can't assimilate this weird church culture, then I can't be a part of this, which I think is the complete opposite personally of what, I mean, the church was designed to do, which is let legit everybody into mm -hmm. it, you know? I, I've run into like a similar 
um, situation with my own personal, like, spiritual and religious journey, um, think that, but on crack. (laughs) (laughs) Um, it's, it's, uh... It's a very intense situation because um, there's so many different cultures and viewpoints and different ways of doing things. And while I give props for at least the community that I am for being very accepting, there's still a huge learning curve of understanding what people are talking about, referring to, and whatnot. Um, yeah, so I, I totally get that. Yeah. Where where is this? Is this on forums online? Is on this Discord, actually. On Discord, on, okay. <laughs> on the dumpster fire that is Discord. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, it's. Explain Discord for anybody who doesn't know what that oh, is. Oh, uh, so. Because <laughs> I didn't know what it was until maybe two months ago. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> <laughs> so Discord was originally meant to be a place for gamers to get together and chat with each other, game with each other, etc. And it's essentially this platform where you make what's called a server. And um, in that server, you have different channels for different topics and you can have voice chats and whatnot. And it all depends on uh, the server owner on how they want to set it up. And originally, it was chat for gamers. Well, other people caught wind of Discord and how that worked and kind of co-opted it. So now you have all these different communities um, just flocking to Discord to kind of make their own. Lo- it's it's like, um, best way I can describe is kind of like a more structured Facebook group. Okay. Um, but just on a different platform. Yeah. What communities have you found yourself most at home in on Discord? Um, I've found myself most at home in like one discord right now there was another one that i was more active in but it's just kind of off and on so one of them is for a game that i play called dragon cave and it's just like this cute uh you collect all the dragon sprites it's it's super simple um and we on the discord we go on there to talk about um in-game events and uh, we can trade with each other and show off our dragons and whatever else. The other one um, is called The Lantern, which is more to do with, uh, it's a pagan server, and uh, we just kind of hang out doing pagan things, you know? So What are pagan things? Um, <laughs> so pagan is a very huge term. Right, it's really broad and encompassing. It's pretty much yeah. not Christian. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's anything not within the church and originally okay. the term was used by um in europe to refer to like um you know european religions that were not in the church like your your you know your greek deities and celtic and, yeah, Gaelic exactly, people exactly. the druids and everybody right they, they were considered pagans well now that that term has expanded to include anything that isn't a one of the abrahamic religions um so a lot of times like uh, you know, Native American religions or, you know, Eastern religions, just, just anything that's not this one thing kind of, kind of, gotcha. yeah. I mean, and I, I don't think everyone agrees with that definition. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's little consensus on anything for that matter. Right. Um, but just in general, that's kind of what the term refers to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it more of, um, is there something, is there a certain branch within paganism as a whole that you more closely identify with? Is that something that's on your server or is it just kind of everybody's there um, that doesn't have an affiliation with the church? Yeah, it's it's kind of a free-for-all. Um, there actually is people on there who do affiliate with Abra- Abrahamic okay. religions. Um, it, it's really what you want to make of it. It's highly individualistic. Uh, we have a lot of people on there who come from Native American backgrounds. We have people that... Um, kind of go towards old mythologies. We have people dealing in Celtic, and um, you know we have, I think one or two people on there who are Jewish. Um, so it's really a melting pot. Uh, yeah. Anything goes. Uh, people do self-identify, uh, but overall, we just kind of accept anyone who wants to show up. Right. As long as they're not mean. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get through the the self-identification process? Is that something that comes up in the group frequently? Absolutely. Like people are constantly trying to find their own identities, their own niches, trying to find what they believe, what jives with them. Um, And it's, everyone goes through the process differently. I know I did. And at some point I just kind of gave up and stopped caring. (laughs) Um, Because like labels are very frustrating because it's like, you know, you don't want to claim a label and feel like you're lying. But at the same time, you want to be able to 
point to something and say, this is what I am, you know? So it's just this weird uh, conflict going on. Um, some people find their home in certain identities and certain labels and other people, they're just like, eh, I'm me. I just kind of do my own thing. So it uh -huh. depends on the person. Yeah. Because in a way, labels can be, to use um, Brummett's terms, both empowering and disempowering exactly. because they give you that sense of community. They give you um, a structure, a social fabric to work within. Mm -hmm. I mean, the church is probably the most mainstream and normative example of that. Just, But even within the church, I mean, there's the Catholic Church. It's kind of the head honcho, everything. Right. And literally thousands of denominations of Protestantism that are constantly yeah. dividing even more. Um, but that's a different topic for a different day. <laughs> <laughs> there's... But within your niche, you know, whether you're Catholic, Lutheran, Baptist, non-denom, whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, everybody still seems to hopefully find unity in the person of, of Christ and God. And it's always frustrating to me and frustrating to really everybody when people tend to focus on literally everything else that they don't agree with mm -hmm. instead of focusing on what they do agree with because then it becomes divisive and people who just want to sit there like you and say, I am I'm me, you know, <laughs> those people become less and less allowed into... Um, these communities because right. now now you have to wear the label to be in the community and the label is the community itself and you start really not tearing at the social fabric but trying to just stitch it closer and closer together to to the point where it's just an echo chamber mm -hmm. which is no bueno at all yeah that's actually a problem that i've run on run into on other servers is i i did server hop which is basically you just go around trying out different servers and seeing where people church hop is. too <laughs> exactly the same thing and um what i've found is that um Pagan servers can go one of two ways. Either they're well managed, which I feel as though my server is, um, or they can kind of dissolve into these conversations of gate of gatekeeping and cultural appropriation and identity politics and mm. um, just all this other stuff that really blocks off conversation and then you just kind of have what you're talking about where the in group just sutures together and anybody else can just, you know. Yeah. What do you think makes the difference between a server that's well managed and a server that kind of succumbs to uh, the noise, for lack of better words? It honestly, a lot of it depends on um, what the server owner and what's called staff. So in a server, generally you have the person who makes it, which is the server owner, and then you have staff like mods um, who have a ministry of power to kind of watch over the server, make sure everybody's following the rules and behaving and stuff like that. So it honestly depends on those people are kind of in charge. Um, and it also depends on their mentality. So, you know, you have to balance wanting to be respectful, which is where a lot of these discussions of cultural appropriation identity politics come from, is, is trying to have a conversation about respect and acceptance. So how do you balance that with going too far where if someone so much as says one word out of line you get labeled as some sort of phobic you know and you need a server owner and mods who are level-headed enough to kind of walk that line yeah in that sense you really are kind of shepherding people it's like yeah. taking it back to like <laughs> it's our flock darn near pastoral image where you, imagery where you have all these sheep the sheeple and you're just you're kind of making sure that they don't wander into where the wolves are exactly yeah you know. pretty much and the the wolves of discontent yeah well because even um within what it seems like you just described to me you have a um the staff that's how many mods would you say does it just depend it, it depends on the server okay. um the bigger the server usually the more staff there should be uh mm -hmm. for us we have um two three kinds of staff basically we have uh, the, what's called the council, that's just the name we gave it. Um, and that's like the core, the core mods, the, the ones that have like the most power and we're kind of, we work together in a democratic way with the server owner having the final say. And then we have um, what's called guardians, which are like the mini mods. They don't have as much power as the council, but they still just help us keep an eye on things and kind of help speak for the people and whatnot. They're extra hands. And then we have faculty, which are people who like to teach or manage our resources or whatever else. That's just kind of the catch-all. Um, so, you know, we just... See, right now, that would make... 
maybe not a little under 10 people worth okay. of staff. Right. So my main point being that it's never just one. Oh, absolutely right? not. Right. Because as soon as one person becomes, you know, not even authoritarian, but when one person becomes solely responsible and accountable for any organization, there is so much immense social pressure on them to maintain order. Yeah. And then they become a sticking point and a target for any sense of discord, pun intended. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. People. Um Usually, so the server owner does have final say. At the end of the day, it's their server. They're the ones running right. it. They own the server. Um, but if you, if all you have is that server owner, it goes. It usually doesn't go well because that's a lot of pressure to manage a group of people by yourself because you can't watch everything. And a lot of times, if you end up in a situation where uh, the server owner is kind of the only person running things, it becomes a dictatorship, hmm. uh, which is not fun because you know either you love this person and you go along with whatever they say, or you're mad. You know, there's no in between. Whereas having all these different staff, we have all a bunch of different viewpoints and opinions, and so we, we kind of are able to handle it in a more democratic way and come to more reasonable conclusions and, you know, come up with yeah. ideas for what we need to do and stuff like that. Yeah. When you, so you have leadership, you have the community. Is the goal mm -hmm. of the server purely the community aspect of it, just bringing people together? Is it something beyond that? Do y'all do things. I mean, I know y'all game and part of it's just, you know, you're, you're gaming together, and you're talking about stuff mm -hmm. in game, but out of game things, the relationships that you form on the server, is there anything beyond that that extends either into physical space, you mm -hmm. start meeting up with people, you kind of catch where I'm going with this? Yeah, absolutely. So our, the Lantern server um, does not, um, it, it's not really focused on gaming. Like we have a little okay. section for gamers, right. but that's not like really the point of it. Um, but we do, a lot of it I would say most of it is community. Some of it's learning. Um, some people are on there to kind of find their own way and talk to other like-minded people. Um, and then um, sometimes it does jump into real life because uh, there's one person, two people on there that I know in real life uh, that I met on campus and I invited them to the server. Um, there's people on there that I consider myself to have close friendships with, uh, so I would totally, I want to meet up with them someday in real life. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a different paradigm for friendships and relationships, but I don't think that makes them any less valid. Right, right. And so is it kind of is is the end game community in itself is there something like what's the goal on the server do y'all yeah. have an established mission statement what what is it there or is it honestly, just we're here yeah honestly the end game is just is mostly community yeah. community and learning that's that's mm -hmm. really the point nice that's really interesting because usually um i think communities as they come together i don't think community for the sake of community is common you know mm -hmm. and i think it's something that digital space and servers like Discord or Facebook groups even um, allow for maybe even the first time in human history. It's just groups that are solely together for the sake of um, friendship um, mm -hmm. and discussion more so than, I guess, going out and doing things and hanging out and, and right. going bowling and getting pizza and eating together. You're truly tunnel focused on the exchange of ideas, the exchanges of mm -hmm. identity and taking in information from other people around you who um, might share like-minded ideas, they might not, but that's the whole point, is, exactly. you're, is you're becoming more well-rounded, you're becoming more knowledgeable about the people in the world around you, which hopefully makes you a better communicator, a better friend to people on and off the server, mm -hmm. um, and just, I mean, hopefully you're, you're strengthened and you know empowered by just the people in this, sorry, in the server, that they're like lifting you up rather than tearing you down. Yeah, I mean, every, like as with any group of people, you do have conflict. Um, but overall, I would say absolutely. They've you know helped my self esteem. They helped me kind of uh, figure out how to deal with my own emotions. And you know, it's it's just really nice to have a group of you know people where it is solely just community. I don't have to necessarily worry about you know texting back or meeting up and doing things or whatever. I can just pop open my laptop and I have my friends there, you know, it's, it's, it's nice. I like it. Yeah. Do you think that's a, that's a strength or of the community? Do you think that is a point where that becomes disempowering to anybody involved or? Um, honestly, I didn't really think about it in those terms. I mean, there's, there's downsides. Like you can't let online stuff consume you as with anything, mm -hmm. um, because you still need person to person interaction. Like 
as much as I would love to reach through the screen, like you, you can't hug people, you can't see them, you can't um, read their tone or their body language. You, you have none of that. You literally just have a digital persona, and you know that there, there, there's downsides to that. You know, and I, I think, but as long as you manage it, um, as long as you manage you know, your online time versus, you know, being out in the real world. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I think you can have the best of both worlds at the end of the day. Yeah. And it's interesting to me how much we choose to be maybe for the sake of efficiency and convenience online rather than in physical space nowadays, because it's, it's preferable for a lot of reasons, but we also see the detrimental Mm -hmm. um, sides of it where a lack of physical intimacy, a lack of body language leads to miscommunication. And as much as you're trying to establish firm, clear, you know, discourse between people that gets muddled with yeah, definitely a lack of control. People, I mean, it took me forever to learn how to text. Yeah, there was um, one time when someone like posted something about disassociative identity disorder. Okay. And I, I made a comment like, "Is it bad that this makes me think of Bates Motel?" Because I just finished the series. Mm-hmm. And uh, side note, great series. I love it. <laughs> um, and I got a little bit of backlash for it because it's interpreted as me comparing DID sufferers to serial killers. Because you know, in in the show, uh, Norman is a ser- like technically a serial killer, um, which was not my intention. Um, I was more focused on you know Norman as a character and looking deeper than just the fact that he's killed people. Um, but regardless, that like none of that got across. I didn't explain myself. I just wrote one comment, and then people just take it as they will. So I had to go back and say, "Oh, I, I apologize. That's not yeah. what I meant to do." Um, so yeah, miscommunications like that happen all the time. Yeah, and uh, it's sometimes it gets really explosive, and people get really angry. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the process of rebuke on digital forums is a lot more immediate, and the process for correction is a lot more slow mm-hmm. because. You know, normally if I said something wrong right here or just said something that I could see in your face was offensive to you, I could mm-hmm. pull back and apologize and right. I could say, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, you didn't mean it that way, or you know what I mean, I'll mm-hmm. rephrase it this way. But you send that text and they have, whoever's, you know, on the other end of the server has a limited time to read the text, formulate a response, and, and correct you however quickly, however extensively that they want. Mm-hmm. And so you have this Im- immense possibility for just people calling each other out oh, on stuff. Oh, yeah. Just calling each other out and then you can <laughs> take those two or three sentences over analyze the living heck out of them yeah. and just blow through the doors of everybody's freaking I don't know ego and whatever mm-hmm. they thought they were doing but then the process of self-correction becomes more difficult because it's it's very hard to apologize mm-hmm. online because it, it because it doesn't seem genuine anger seems very genuine for some reason because you can mm-hmm. express it very clearly through text, and I think it's almost more readable through text because it seems passive aggressive. Right. Things mm-hmm. seem to come across in text. Oh my gosh, I got an email. Sorry, <laughs> unprofessional. Um, <laughs> Cut that out. Exactly. <laughs> Things come across in text um, a little bit more neutral or cold, which tends to be interpreted as maybe angry or distant right. or upset or passive aggressive. Mm-hmm. And then correction, where you try to be emotional and and genuine and humble about things, is very, very difficult to express through the medium of of just type. Right. And that's why I've, and I've noticed this, is when I'm on a text space, I have a very um, specific style where I do use a variety of emojis and I do use um, different I mean, they're not words. Is is aw like a w e? Is that even a word? Like probably not. Just kind of fillers or cushions yeah, and stuff. Exactly. Okay. Like I I kind of adopt a lot of that into my um my text and stuff so that I can convey those certain emotions, which mm-hmm. is more challenging. It takes a bit more conscious effort than if I'm just like sitting here and talking to you and you you say something. You know, I could have you know, facial reaction, tone, all of that, and that conveys emotion more easily. Yeah, and I think uh, Snapchat in particular, I don't think either you or I have it at the moment, but do you have Snapchat? I used to use it Same. until they updated it and messed it all up. Okay. I, I hate how bulky the app is now. It's ridiculous. It was okay. fine before, but they just had to Right, it up. and so with, I think both of our limited experiences with it, because I got off of it mm, as soon as I came into college, mm-hmm. it was just taking up too much of my time, yeah. too much of my space, you know, mm-hmm. in my head. 
different story. But yeah. there was a bit of an upside to Snapchat. There were certainly many disempowering things about Snapchat. Mm -hmm. But one of the best things was you could do video and you right. could do, you know, you could take a picture of your face and mm -hmm. you could kind of show more expression. And in a way you could front that, you know, you could say, okay, that makes it m much easier to fake or to falsify whatever you're feeling because you can say a smile and then type something happy, but really just be completely sad or upset yeah. and, and turn the phone around. Mm -hmm. But I do think that personally, like on the receiving end, helped levy my anxiety a little bit in terms of how people were actually feeling. Mm -hmm. The disempowering side is it's radically addictive for some yeah. weird reason. Well, it's, it all has to do with the reward centers of the brain. Like once you associate um, the numbers and the notifications and stuff with the reward, like you see that pop up, you open it and you get something. Mm -hmm. And I think psychologically, like we view that as a reward. Yeah. And so you keep wanting to get rewards. Yeah. Um, well, because it was originally designed as a game and people would more look at their Snapchat scores as commodities now, just something mm -hmm. to kind of say, oh, here's mine, or it'll be a, a random ask 20 questions thing. Is right. I think the extent that most people take it. No one takes it super duper seriously. But, you know, fundamentally the app was designed to quantify connection mm -hmm. and to turn that connection into a competition with other people. And yeah, with the snap streak. Mm -hmm, with the snap streak, especially yeah. because, I mean, you think about high school, I mean, small school, big school, you have people who you perceive as popular, perceive as very well liked, and mm -hmm. you have people you perceive as maybe they're, they could be just more introverted or they're just, you know, less popular. Or and the just, weirdos and the jocks yeah, and the, you know, I was one usual. of them, you know, business <laughs> as usual, right. But you take that into a space where it can be purely quantified seemingly mm -hmm. and put into numbers. You have, you know, I know people that's got frick thousand day streaks 1200 day streaks at these point oh my goodness people are crazy about it and it's it also connects you with your friends it keeps you you know at a weird distance from them because you have this illusory connection of oh my gosh i get to see them i get to talk to them i get to share videos i get to do life with them and they can see what's going on with my story right. but I still think there's something deeply personal about experiencing physical space with one another. There's a physical intimacy that I personally desire with, with my friends, which is why I prefer calling people for one over texting them. I prefer FaceTiming over calling them. It's just, I, I prefer that media better because it better communicates what I want to get across and it eliminates all that confusion and the competition. Yeah, I actually have the opposite problem. <laughs> okay. Um, being around people uh, it can be very nerve wracking. Right. Um, because I, I, I have anxiety, so I have a problem where I will read into people's facial expressions and tone and body language and, um, cause all those are nonverbal. So I kind of sit here and I overanalyze that. Um, and when it comes to talking to people, I struggle. I, I'm very bad at eye contact. Like Same. I'm so. I can't do that. Same. It's, it's so nerve wracking just because the eyes are the window to the soul, mm -hmm. you know? And like, so it's to, to kind of quell that anxiety, I have to put up this, well, not a wall, but kind of distance myself from that. So I don't like looking people in the face with text. I, I that, that's not a problem. You know, I can just mm -hmm. go through, through the words and, and there are times when it is nerve wracking. Cause yeah, your, your, your words can be misconstrued or whatever and things can go wrong um but overall it's i, I don't have to worry about re trying to read into those nonverbal signals right i can just focus on the text and everybody has their own typing style and their own stuff and you know people ha also have this understanding where they know they probably have to clarify that's kind of a mm -hmm. underlying expectation you think that <laughs> we're, yeah well we're still I, figuring it out i mean it might just be me uh, yeah. i because I have an understanding that sometimes I just need to clarify, right. you know, and I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but yeah, like it's, it's with just the text, I feel like I have less to worry about. Okay. Um, so I think it just depends on the person. And I For don't sure. get me wrong though. I love being around people in the flesh. I like being around people physically and stuff, but it can get stressful for me in, in a way that text isn't. Yeah, because as much as you have that physical intimacy within physical space in the real mm -hmm. world, quote unquote, you also have the, the real world potential for physical pain and physical conflict, mm -hmm. you know, and while you can kind of receive a nasty text and get hurt and, yeah. and have, you know, emotional trauma and damage and frick, I've had texts that destroy me. 
you yeah, know, ex-girlfriends and whatnot, but it's fine. And, <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, but I think there's something still about somebody sitting across the table from you, not that I'm going to do it, but that could theoretically punch you in the mouth if you say something wrong, you yeah. know, or if you, or if you read into it too much and you don't understand where they're coming from and suddenly you get this blank face from them mm -hmm. and you have so much ambiguity and you can't read them, you're so close, but the, the distance is increased emotionally because you don't have that intimacy anymore that you would expect from being together in physical space. Yeah, well that said, like, emotional pain still registers similarly to physical pain. There has yeah. been times I've gotten into arguments with um, an ex or a friend or whatever where I was sitting there thinking I would take them hitting me over these messages. Hmm. Um, but that just might be me personally. Um, but yeah, I, I think... Like, words can hurt. Um, that is true. And I think it just depends on the emotional capacity of the person. Um, but, yeah, there's just there's just been times where I'm just like, you know, at this point, I'd rather you be sitting in front of me screaming at me than dealing with this whole texting game. Yeah, because what's also been tempting for me, I don't do it so much anymore. I'm surprised at the lack of texting that I do, you know? Yeah. It's weird. I used to be really frequent or... I guess prolific with it, but I don't mm -hmm. just randomly text people anymore. But what I used to do all the time is just you read back through your texts, you know, especially if yes. there's an argument going on yeah. or if there's some drama that you've got to figure out with people or you're getting second, third hand accounts or when people send you screenshots of their other conversations. Oh, I'm like, that's always fun. Ooh, the tea <laughs> is being spilled and it's going to be great. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a pretty common thing. Cause like on discord servers, we deal with trolls and just yeah. people just, coming in and not being great people. We also have, you know, more predatory behavior that happens too. Dang. And so it's, it's a fun time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we will, you know, a lot of times we'll be taking screenshots to document what these people have said so that when we ban them, uh, we can warn other servers about them. So gotcha. that, that's, yeah, that's one of the things about tax is like, it's all recorded. Mm -hmm. um, because like, we'll sit there and we're very comfortable with each other and, you know, we'll say whatever, but at the end of the day, it can still be recorded. Um, we have files on dozens of trolls and, uh, you know, frankly, pedophiles and very, um, Gosh. very predatory people. Yeah. And we have files on all this stuff and we have it saved. Um, you know, so it's, if somebody, if a troll comes in and, you know, they, you know, do whatever terrible thing, uh, we document that and they, they messed up in our server. Well, now all the other servers know, cause we, we, we notify them. So now it's, you know, you're, you're branded, um, which, it's it's empowering and disempowering as well yeah because you have the ability to protect yourself and to protect your server and to warn and protect other communities others. and to protect others mm -hmm. because you can say hey look out for this guy but you can also i mean you can take anything out of context absolutely you know and you can i mean that's how a bunch of really really good memes but i'm sure also how a lot of bad uh conversations or arguments have started where mm -hmm. somebody screenshots, you know, X and Y name above and then these two texts and then sends it off to somebody or posts it, heaven forbid, on Facebook or for the yeah. public to see and says, oh my gosh, look at this person. How blank, blank, blank phobic mm -hmm. are they? Um, when there's more to the story. When there's always more to the story mm -hmm. and then you're stripping that other person possibly of their ability to defend themselves and you have right. a very public call out culture where you, you have no... Like once you're branded, sense. you're branded. Right. Which yeah. is scary. Um, generally speaking, at least when I deal with situations like that, I go through and record the entire conversation from mm -hmm. start to finish. Yeah. Um, so it, that way you get the surrounding context and stuff like that. And the other thing I've noticed, at least with myself and a lot of other mods, um, we'll let it kind of run for a little bit. Um, just to gather evidence. Just Yeah, exactly. Because we we try to be as evidence-based as possible. Because okay. like, we want to be fair. We don't want to start just kicking everybody to kick everybody. Um, so generally speaking, like somebody will come on and start posting stuff. And usually in servers, there's a warning system. You know, right. strike one, strike two, strike three, you're out. Um, and like from start to finish, all that gets recorded and compiled. Um, sometimes you do have that situation where a quote, like it's just like one or two lines or whatever, um, but usually we try to get all of it. 
um, yeah. up from when they like show up and start messing around all the way up until we kick them out of the server. Mm -hmm. I think that's even how um, Twitter works as well as they, I mean, for one, they have a strike system and they have bans and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And there's been some contentions recently. I mean, for one, uh, just when people tweet, I think we actually, we had Pilch together last semester and we talked Did about we? this, or not last semester, but two semesters ago in 303, right? Yeah. And I think we talked about this explicitly where Twitter is now a newsworthy publication. Not in the sense that Twitter as an entity is publishing things, but things that are published on Twitter or on political actors' personal mm -hmm. accounts or just celebrities' personal accounts is now fair game for tabloids, for um, legitimate publications, quote unquote, to tear into them and just either destroy mm -hmm. rep reputation, slander them, get a puff piece, um, and run through, I mean, again, snippets of information. I mean, up until recently, tweets have been 150 characters max. And so that platform in of itself is extremely constricting when it comes to mm -hmm. free flow of information and ideas. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I, I'm actually not really on the Twitter scene. Yeah. Um, I just kind of stay away from that mess. But I guess Trump would be a good example, mm -hmm. just some of the stuff he throws on there. But the trick is that, you know, if you throw one or two tweets, it kind of sucks if you get branded for that. But, you know, just like with the screenshots on the Discord server, you can compile evidence and right. just slap it on the table. It's like, here you go. Yeah, and it's hard when the, when the evidence seems to be mounting, you know, but we also live in the in the same space in in twitter for example somebody shares a tweet and then just blasts it or retweets it and just blasts yeah. the original person mm -hmm. how likely are the people following the person who retweeted it or shared it to go through that thread and investigate for themselves yeah. and look as opposed to believe you know this this second hand account or this celebrity who's commenting on the other celebrity about mm -hmm. what they believe in this that and the other yeah which that's kind of the beauty of the internet in some ways is that the the usual person would not bother to go through and do the investigating but, but there are is. people who are willing <laughs> to go through and do the investigating. Yeah. So uh, there was actually this whole um, controversy with a, a, a singer, Melanie Martinez, and there was an incident between her and this uh, other woman, uh, T Timothy or something like that. And um, uh, the, the, the woman posted this whole thing about um, Melanie violating her and stuff. And Melanie came back with her own response, denouncing the situation. I'm sorry, you know, saying I'm sorry she felt she had to do this, etc. And there were people who flooded that situation and did the investigating. And like, you you see, you see YouTubers putting together videos. You see people compiling pictures and messages and posts. And it's it's you know it's yeah. like watching a, a weird episode of Sherlock Holmes. Right. Well, because we're always battling for truth and we're always battling for open and honest flow of information, mm -hmm. you know, and that's obstructed by people who are, uh, for one, restricting information and not allowing people to speak, silencing yeah. them, you know, just telling people, oh, shut up, get off here, mm -hmm. um, trolling them. There's also people who silence that by giving false information, you know, yes. and that it's so hard to quantify because you never know again whether or not somebody's going to actually have access, the, the lay person who's not doing the investigating, to these other videos unless mm -hmm. they're just all threaded together in some weird... Just, just viral scene where, yeah. where, you, where it all comes back together and you are, I guess, really just by, by fortune, if anything else, seeing the, the correction on your feed as well mm -hmm. as the initial problem or issue, whatever it is. So the, the conflict can still linger in the sense that, again, correction comes, but it may not come to everybody and some people are still sitting on that false information that's for one outdated, but also just wrong. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's hard to, like once somebody internalizes information or a certain viewpoint, it's very hard to break them of that. And you know, you see this across, you know, every subject under the sun. Um, like people who, when they f initially found out what happened, again, going back to my example with Melanie and, and this other woman, uh, they were burning merchandise and they were all up in arms and so angry. Um, bef and there was so much conversation about it, but like once those people internalized that viewpoint that, you know, Melanie did this horrible thing, you know, that, that was it, that was yeah. game over. So for sure. And I think especially, um, within mass media, and I don't mean to pick on them, even though I 
tend to sometimes because the, the new cycle just operates in a very sadistic way. Oh, yeah. Almost. Yeah. Because the, the way I've kind of internalized it at this point is that you have um, cases that go around and, and, you know, news stories that break out. And then there's the initial story which is the surface story, but inevitably the next two, three days in the news cycle, the other networks are correcting it, rebuking, mm-hmm. arguing against it. And so you, in a sense, are, are just opening the floor for a debate. And if right. it was viewed that way, I think it would be much more interesting and, and helpful for me, you know, because then I wouldn't see it as so oppositional if you were genuinely yeah. saying, hey, here's what we figured out. And everyone's like, well, let's figure this out together. That'd be kind of cool. Right. That'd be interesting. But what happens is somebody says, this is what happened. This is when it happened, where it happened, how it happened, why mm-hmm. it happened. And then some other news source just completely rips that story originally to shreds mm-hmm. and, and throws their propaganda piece out, you know, usually just in opposition. If for the sake of opposition, that's one thing. But also, I mean, sometimes we just legit get it wrong in the first try. Most times we legit get it wrong yeah. in the first attempt. And so it's strange how when when breaking news is happening, I'm like, okay, if I turn the news on again in three days, how what's the likelihood that this original story is going to already be eaten through and correct, or maybe not corrected, but just argued and battled against, you know? Yeah, that entire framework is actually um, putting science at a horrible disadvantage. Like, I'm, I don't mean to veer off left lane, but like oh, for sure. this this um, idea of mass media being a debate and, you know, things up for scrutiny and whatnot is actually hurting uh, scientific um, communication. Okay. Uh, because there's this uh, framework where on def- different news outlets um, equal time. So when you have two people on opposite opposite sides, they they have to have equal time in the debate. Well, the problem with that is you have the scientist that actually knows their stuff and is educated and you know knows what they're talking about up against somebody who you know has their own agenda and doesn't really have a full understanding and they get equal time. And the problem with that is it gives an appearance of there being a debate when there isn't one. Climate change is a primary example. Mm. Um, Climate change is real. I'm going to just start with that. (laughs) Um, Totally do not spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to find out that's a hoax. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, that a lot of people um, uh, uh, who oppose the concept of climate change, the reason why they do is because, you know, they see... Uh, they have this sense that there is debate in, some, in the scientific community because of this mm. framework of the climate change deniers give an equal time to the actual scientists. The scientists are at consensus. They are like across the board. Which all, is rare. It, it's extremely <laughs> Which rare. Which is extremely rare. Exactly. And, and the scientists, there is consensus. But because this consensus has to go up against a climate change denier who cherry picks their data, uses um, really shady tactics when it comes to conveying information um, and all that stuff, then it looks like there isn't a consensus. Right. And so that's what people are saying. Well, there's no, there's no real consensus. Well, that's why. It's because the mass media is giving this appearance and the scientists mm. are off in the corner screaming, no, we agree this is a problem. <laughs> yes. Because I think they've either manipulatively figured this out or just kind of, you know, it works this way and the framework is so set Mm -hmm. in stone that there's no going back anywhere else that, I mean, confrontation is good for viewership. It's Mm -hmm. getting less and less so as there are alternative means of viewing media and alternative Mm -hmm. means of receiving information. Um, People keep saying that print is dead, but I know a bunch of people, well, maybe print, but I mean, just general news publications. There are a lot of people who subscribe to digital local newspapers. You know, my parents do, and I think a bunch of other people um, back in San Antonio do. It's it's just, you still want a a, a locally sourced, you know, reasonably credible uh, outlet. I'm losing my words here, but... Mm -hmm. Um, going back to how how the debates work and the and the viewership being driven up by uh, confrontation, there's no real incentive for for media companies and networks to allow the scientists to speak, Mm-mm. because if they do and the scientists, um, you know, assuming they're right and assuming they just wholeheartedly and even handedly just dismiss the opposition, you know, mm-hmm. with that extra minute, two minutes, three minutes, that whatever it takes. Um, that's not as entertaining right. for people, which is also interesting because now I'm thinking, thinking about it, I'm 
referencing in my head a bunch of YouTube videos where it's so-and-so destroys this person on climate change, <laughs> so-and-so destroys this person on abortion or gun rights. Yeah. So there, there maybe is that, but I think that's a lot more YouTube, that's a lot more echo chambery in a yes. way that definitely feeds back into the concept of echo chambers that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the media, uh, of mass media, you know, networks, the big names and television, there, there's no reason profit-wise for those companies to allow, um, I guess, a more free-flowing expression, you know? Yeah, we can, uh, for a lot of those tactics, we can actually blame the tobacco industry. Hmm. Um, they, they were the ones who sort of came up with the handbook for how to combat scientific arguments, um, and that involves, like, cherry-picking, it involves um, just... Because they make their own studies too, don't they? Yeah. Yep. And uh, <laughs> basically, they, they kind of came up with the handbook on how to sell uh, or sow um, misrepresentation and misunderstanding of science. Because uh, the, the, what ended up happening was the scientists were coming in and studying the effects of tobacco on the body, and they found out, hey, smoking is bad for you guys. Like, don't do it. The tobacco company, they have to protect their interests. This is their livelihood. This is how they're making their money. And to have a scientific consensus that this is bad for your health, it's going to hurt their profits. So what do you do? You have to combat the science and push forward your own sort of version of the story so that, you know, your your patron, your uh, customers will keep buying your product because, you know, that way they have this idea in their head that, oh, the scientists don't know what they're talking about, whatever, I'll keep buying your product. They knew exactly what they were doing. They knew their product was bad for people. They, they knew what, you know, what they were pushing, and they did it anyway because profit. And you see the same thing with climate change. We have known that there has been an issue, or at least had an inkling of it, surprisingly, since the late 1800s. We knew that humans were having some sort of effect on the climate since late 1800s to early 1900s. Where does that come from? Um, like the studies or? Yeah, yeah, because I'm like, um, ooh, I'm just it? not super versed on like weather and meteorology and how long that's actually been a science. Oh, I'm really God. curious. It's... I know. See, Sorry to put you on the spot there. No, I'm, I'm But that's just not to... something I knew. No, I'm very bad at um, remembering right, names and history. Dates. It's, it's okay. so but bad. But that's very interesting if it's true, and I'll have to look it up later. Yeah, well... It just you... adds some scope to the debate. Right. Because people think it's a new issue. It's not. It really has not been. Um, scientists started taking an interest in climate in the 1800s and started publishing... Um, calculations on world models and climate models and stuff like that. So that, that's kind of when it was in its infancy. So once you start getting that baseline of, okay, how does climate work, which is what they were working on, to, you know, once they figure out, you know, the greenhouse effect and albedo and all these other things, um, they realize, you know, hold up, CO2 is a factor here. And then as you go through, you know, the decades and, and so right. on and so forth, you, you More start... More industrialization, yeah, and you put two and two together. Exactly, exactly. That's kind of what happened. And, and two and two is starting to be put together very early on. Right. And so in, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but in, I think it's around the 70s, give or take, there was actually cons a bipartisan support about the issue of climate change. Right. Um, the, all the politicians were on board with doing something about it. The scientists were all, you know, they were respected and listened to. And, um, then once we got into, uh, towards the Reagan area era and on, that's when they dropped yeah. the ball. So, you know, we, we have known about this issue and there has been bipartisan support on it in the past. There's been, a, there, the consensus on climate change has done nothing but gotten stronger. Mm. Um, and now it's, you know, everything's just a mess where apparently climate change is a Chinese hoax now. So, right. you know, and, and, and as someone who's getting, you know, a college level degree in this, it's a very frustrating thing to see that we've had decades, we had consensus, we were, we were figuring this out, we were moving forward, <laughs> and now we have just gone back in time, you know, and it's, it's the most frustrating thing ever. It's the same thing with people who want to give measles back to the frickin' population. Ah, <laughs> uh, do you really want to get me started on anti-vaccine? Um, no, not right now. Actually, <laughs> yeah, we may be in a little bit, um, it's a bit of a hot topic, but I don't mind it. But coming back to climate change, because that first point that you made just about the scope and scale um, of the conversation and the mm -hmm. research and the literature really opened my mind, because um, I think 
because my family and a lot of my friends are pretty right leaning, right. and that's and those are the people who kind of get stereotyped as it's a hoax or it's not real. Mm -hmm. um, the not arguments that I've heard, but I think the equivocations that I've heard are along the lines of, yes, it's real, yes, it's happening, but the scope isn't large enough for us to conclude causation and, uh, as opposed to correlation. Uh, yeah, and I so, love that argument. <laughs> right, and so the fact that, you know, yes, we have more factories, and yes, there's more CO2 in the air, mm -hmm. but maybe the ozone's been this way forever, and now we're just figuring it out and discovering it. So, yeah, yeah. So, it's, it's the, so the scope really does affect the, those equivocations and kind of this this further dismiss them a little bit because I've already kind of been like really really bud like two and two should come together right um, my it, my favorite argument is uh, people who say that oh well yeah the climate's changing but it's normal it's natural because the painful thing is they're not wrong our climate yeah. it, over the history of the earth has changed uh, it has changed dramatically we've had had or Excuse me, my grammar. <laughs> we did have these levels of CO2 in the past in Earth's history. That's that's true. The problem is scope and scale. We The Earth has never seen change happen this fast. And the problem with that is we don't have time to adapt. Uh, we are adapted for our current situation. But are we adapted for a world that is, you know, hotter, that where sea levels are higher, where we don't have ice caps, where we're altering food webs? Right. We are not prepared for that world, and neither are any of the species. That's why we're going through a mass extinction. Like, nobody is prepared for this. Where's the mass extinction taking place? Oh, it's global. Yeah. Yeah, it's completely global. We're losing more species than we're... Really? Yeah, we're losing more species than we're discovering. Um, this is one of the biggest mass extinctions since probably the, the dinosaurs probably it's so interesting yeah <laughs> well because i i think i mean i'm probably just thinking planet earth in my brain because i yeah. love planet earth and ah, oh, freaking have you seen a snoop dog narrate planet earth yes oh my gosh i love it all right we won't get into that but that's freaking amazing but it's gosh that just adds a, a different taste in my mouth mm -hmm. if i can phrase it that way because again it's it's interesting that when I hear that first equivocation of, oh, we've only been doing science and research and literature on this for the past mm, 100, 200 years, mm -hmm. you know, it's very easy to be ignorant and that ignorance can lead to maybe arrogance in either direction Yeah. about, okay, there's so much that we don't know and there is so much that we are still um, speculating on mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, we can analyze the patterns now and the when you said, oh, we've never experienced this before in Earth's history, I'm thinking... I've got no idea whether we did or not. I'm not sure anybody has any idea whether we did or not in terms of, again, the scale and scope, how yeah, rapidly this change right. is taking place. Um, but it does still scare me just because no matter what your timeline is, the fact that, I mean, extinction's a thing, you can think, okay, maybe it's natural, but mm -hmm. I mean, if stuff's dying, that's usually not the best sign in the world, mm -hmm. especially if we're not gaining diversity, we're losing diversity. Right. And I mean... Humans, we like to think of ourselves as being at the top of the food chain, but natural disasters destroy that food chain mm -hmm. in the blink of an eye. They destroy entire ecosystems, Mount St. Helens, Hurricane Harvey, Katrina, I mean, freaking uh, typhoons in the East Asia and tsunamis. They, like, yeah, it's civilizations get leveled very quickly. Oh, yeah, oh, most certainly. It's, um, the other issue with the climate change thing is it's the prime example of the fact that the general public is not well versed or educated on what the scientific process is and what any what anything means. You know, when we say consensus, people don't understand the gravity of that. When we talk about theory and hypothesis, people misunderstand what those things are. Um, you know, we, we talk about the theory of evolution. We talk about right. you know the theory of you know gravity or whatever. People don't understand what theory really means. And, and what they think is, a th they misconstrue theory as being more like a hypothesis. Oh, it, it's just, you know, it's only a theory. It's just a guess. That's not what a theory is. Um, just like how when we talk about the scientific process, people don't, you know, when you're, when you're in school, you talk about, like, you get a hypothesis right. and you form your experience. That's actually only one part of the entire process. Once you go through that study, you make your hypothesis, you make your experiment, you get your conclusions, you analyze your conclusions, that's one part. 
So then the next thing you have to do is you have to publish your studies, get that all peer reviewed. Get it peer reviewed, yeah. Right, which that that's a whole <laughs> that's a whole beast in and of itself. Ivory towers. Exactly. And then you have to have other scientists replicate your results and have that replicated you know, hundreds of times even yeah. before it becomes accepted as a theory. Mm -hmm. You know, but people just think, oh, theory is a guess. Right. They don't see all this this entire extensive Some process. of that's semantic and it, it's mm -hmm. it's definitely semantic and I Absolutely. see I can definitely see your frustration coming from it, you know, as somebody who's got a lot <laughs> firmer grip on yeah. the you know, on the scientific process than I do because I've been through freshman biology. I generally right. got a, a decent understanding of what's supposed to happen and from my understanding theories come as the result of experimentation rather than a priori assumptions. Yes. You know, the, the hypothesis comes before and the theory comes from, okay, we've already tested this, tested this, tested this, tested this, mm -hmm. and there are still theories that are incomplete. I mean, even general relativity has its, yep. its holes and its gaps, and that's why people are still doing research and still doing experiments because yep. you have the greatest incentive in the world as a scientist to prove other scientists wrong, mm -hmm. which is a good, I think, <laughs> a, an interesting spirit to have in the spirit, like yeah. well, for the sake of progress, you know, proving other people wrong and, and you know, lifting yourself in a bit on the pedestal saying, look what I did, but then mm -hmm. a hundred years from now, you could be wrong too. But right. another piece of the puzzle gets, you know, put hopefully where it should be and you, you keep moving forward. Where that gets tricky is when people start doubting the validity of the process itself mm -hmm. and start doubting whether or not science is a even a reasonable means of, of knowing or mm -hmm. experiencing because there's kind of the whole science versus religion thing and how it's all oppositional you know I've got yeah. a lot got a lot of friends who again we, we see this rhetoric of debate and this rhetoric of opposition where I mean, people are just so black and white about it as if everybody on the other side is antagonistic to me and everybody on my side better defend themselves or be ready to attack the other side. We're looking for um, holes and gaps as, as maybe we should be in that same weird spirit of competition for the sake of progress. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard because the, the detriments there um, is division, our division, and just a lack of community and ultimately a lack of progress if you can't have a consensus in a democratic society mm -hmm. at, at any political level then you're you're ultimately not going to move forward because you can't move forward without leaving the minority behind and right. you know disempowering um, them I wouldn't say that it's necessarily competition in the scientific community okay. I guess I guess the closest thing to competition I'd say is like people wanting to make new discoveries okay um but Wanting to disprove something, I, I don't quite think that's the mentality. It's not that scientists want to set out and disprove something. It's that um, you test it over and over and over right. uh, to make sure it's not wrong. Yeah, it's um, not as malignant as I probably described yeah. it. It's more with the spirit of, hey, there's something else here, and I wonder what it is. And then if that ends up disproving or poking mm -hmm. holes in somebody else's stuff, then it right. does. You know, um, it's just like with with gravity. Um, people have you know, over centuries done, you know, thousands upon thousands of tests on yep. gravity um, because scientists don't ever like to say they're 100% certain. That is a very frustrating thing about the scientific community. Yep. But uh, it's the recognition that there's always something new to discover. There's always something new to learn. Uh, so that's why scientists are, aren't very comfortable with ever saying 100%. Because right. there's always that chance, and there's there's a very there's a recognition on that. But the problem is the general public ta takes that and views that one percent chance as oh well then it's you incomplete, know, exactly. it's unreliable. Which that that's that's not quite the case. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, even in the IPCC reports, they use certain language. Um, and at this at this point, we're at um, you know the climate change stuff is extremely likely to be caused by humans. Extremely likely. It's like 95, if not more, percent certainty. Right. And for a scientific, for a scientific community, that's as good as yeah. as it's gonna get. Well, because there's also experience information, but that tends to be correlation or, or mm -hmm. something along those lines. Right. And and scientists like to account for everything. They like to account for every possible variable, every possible permutation, everything. And that's kind of what that's meant to reflect is reflect every possibility. Yeah. And I think it also, again, semantically and rhetor like rhetorically becomes difficult because 
um, there is the off chance, and I really do think it's an off chance, but mm -hmm. especially having grown up in the church, there is an appearance within the church that people who do science have this air of ivory towers mm -hmm. again and just kind of love to shove their um, knowledge down people's throats as if they yeah. don't have this air of humility about them, as if they mm -hmm. don't, I mean, just openly admit, yes, there are still holes in the theory that we are actively working on. That's why we have jobs to, to right. do these things. That's, <laughs> that's why we're scientists, because there's still holes in the theories. The puzzle is not done. If it was done, we would be sitting on our butts in our ivory towers, like drinking a mimosa exactly. or something. You know, and so I think there's just a drastic misunderstanding of of the heart and the intent behind science. And I think, you know, vice versa with, with religion, because I think there's some, there's certainly antagonism on both ends where people think, oh, if you believe just straight out of the book, there's there's no scientific process to that. There's no um, evidence besides archaeological and historical evidence. How reliable is that? Because you're looking backwards instead of doing experiments in the present, this, that, and the other right. thing. And when we start trying to privilege certain ways and means of knowing exclusively at the expense of every other mean of knowing and we're silencing people again, mm -hmm. that's very detrimental to progress because the best thing you can get um, the most progressive thing you can do is speak with one another and talk with one another. Yeah, I mean, the, honestly, science and the church have been in conflict since there's been science and the church. Um, they have always been uh, kind of button heads. And I think a lot of that comes from um, science is viewed as a threat to the concept of oh, God. Yeah. And science is over here. They're just trying, they, they want to seek truth and seek to understand the world. Um which, you know, the church views that as a threat. So I, I think, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why we have so many problems now is because, like, we're in a, you know, mostly Christian society. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's just this mentality of, of, you know, science versus religion. Yeah. You know, it's like, how do you deal with that? How do you solve that debate? And, you know, I don't know yeah. if we can. Right. And I think it's it truly is the militant 1% on either side because mm -hmm. there are um, voices from the scientific community, not of the scientific community, but from the scientific community who are extremely militant about their atheism and yeah. like saying, hey, not only can or will silence eventually disprove God or take away the need for religion in general or faith in general, but mm -hmm. saying it already has. How stupid are you now that we understand relativity, now that we understand remotely how climate change works and how mm -hmm. the world is spinning and that there's dark matter and all these different things. How can you remotely believe that, you know, there's there's an invisible dude in the sky taking care of you and holding you like a baby? Yeah. You know, it's it's very, very difficult to have conversations with those types of people, but again, they're the 1%, but I think we perceive that 1% as m a much bigger minority or majority than it actually is on, on mm -hmm. both sides, and so that stirs a lot of anxiety when it comes to having conversation because yeah. you're afraid of conflict, but just about any conversation I've had, I've been blessed to have like really amicable friends, you right. know, but and just haven't run into a whole lot of super crazy people on either side mm -hmm. but just about every conversation i've had and i've had quite a few of them has been polite has been open and we usually come to the consensus yeah it's it's still up and out there mm -hmm. no no one system has got everything completely locked down even i mean in my opinion if you're a decent christian you shrug your shoulders with a bunch of stuff because you say if it's not in the book if god didn't say anything i don't know right. you know and and the same thing with science if it's not in the book if we haven't tested it Shrug your shoulders. We don't know yet. Right. I think, I think the difference is that science has a streamlined process that has been refined over centuries to, you know, broach topics and find truth and stuff like that. Whereas religion, it, it doesn't have that. It, it's, I feel like a lot of it's more anecdotal and, mm -hmm. you know, is faith and is, you know, trying to draw from a text. Yeah. Um, and... I mean, obviously, for me personally, I, I do skew towards the science side. It's what mm -hmm. I'm comfortable and familiar with. I wasn't really brought up with right. religion. Um, but I think that's like just another point of contention with the scientists towards religion. It's like, well, well, we've worked out this whole process, and it works, and we've proven it works, and you're, you're just claiming something. And mm -hmm. that makes scientists feel very uncomfy. Yeah. And then just, I mean, branching f immediately down this rabbit hole, it just... <laughs> it kind of has to be hit on where, mm -hmm. you know, 
there's this whole, oh gosh, I'm going to forget the word for it, but there's this whole line of thought that says science has to be talked about exclusively on scientific terms yes. and religion has to be talked about exclusively in religion terms and neither one of them can be perceived as fulfilling the role of the other, that they're mutually exclusive in that respect. Right. And so, you know, science is your way and your means of knowing about the world and what's in it and religion has to be talked about is how you interact with it. Mm-hmm. And, and how you participate in it morally, ethically, um, how you do community well, how you, you know, don't kill people, don't enslave people, right. don't treat them poorly, like love one another as you would yourself, that whole spiel. Mm-hmm. And so there's this whole line of thought that says, okay, it's better if these two things are separate, but as soon as you, in my mind, separate the two, you're just allowing the opposition all the more space in between them to, to fight and to duke it out, when really... I think there's there's very, not that they're overlap such a hard word and I can't actually pin this down, so I'm struggling with it right now, mm-hmm. but it's it's very hard to actually find a conversation where both science and religion can speak. Yeah, I think, honestly, uh, interestingly enough, I would say psychology is a good place okay. for it. Um, there's been studies being done on uh, people who are spiritual, uh, discussing quality of life and happiness right. and stuff like that. Um, there's been... MRI scans on people who uh, meditate and see how that affects their brain. Um, so I, I think there there are little pockets that are trying to st- that are trying to broach that topic yeah. and start finding those bridges. Um, but yeah, there's definitely still a big divide, and that's something I struggle with myself because I'm not gonna. Go, I don't I don't feel comfortable with just going out and just like jumping into the trenches, jumping in and just believing stuff. You know, that's yeah. that's not. At this point, that's just not how my mind works. That's not how, mm-hmm. you know, I was brought up. That's not what I was around. Uh, so I'm constantly questioning everything. Yeah. Um, and at some point, I, I, I've kind of arrived at this conclusion where, you know, you have, um, it, it's it's a way of mentally taking care of yourself. Um, right. And, I mean, obviously it's personal for everybody, but, like, everyone has... It, Humans are are these strange creatures that somehow developed, you know, vast sense of consciousness, and you know that that in of itself is very beautiful. I think even if it kind of gets us in trouble a lot, yes. <laughs> um, but like we just some people would argue it's the subconscious that gets you in trouble or the unconscious. Uh, I guess it's Freud. True. Yeah, the, the that, consciousness. Right. I, I'm evolving both under yes. under that umbrella. I just. We, we have such a vast consciousness and this capability to perceive things and intake information and formulate all these different thoughts and opinions, ideas, and emotions that it's like, you know, how do you go through and, and do maintenance on that? How do you take care of that? How do you view it and interact with it? Um, so at the end of the day, like, as long as you're happy and healthy and, you know... Safe. And safe, exactly. And you're, and you're putting out, you know, good stuff, then who cares what you believe in if it works for you um i just I, I have a thing that i live by you know if it if it harm none do what you will you know if you're not hurting other people and you do you you know it's mm-hmm. just i think it just depends it's it's a very vast thing to consider and it gives me a headache it does and it, <laughs> and it rightfully should because i think that's something that i mean you're we're stretching into morality at mm-hmm. this point and just morality. It's a oh, it's a hot button subject because I think where where religion kind of steps in to that is just immediately with with laws and commandments and and yeah. you know restrictions and a lot of the pushback against religion, especially now, is that it's retrogressive, that it's moving backwards, and there's all these silly restrictions that don't need to be there. And some of those mm-hmm. voices saying that honestly just haven't read the book that well, in my personal opinion, because mm-hmm. there's a lot of stuff that people perceive that isn't real. No time to get into that. But yeah, but but fundamentally, you do have a certain prescribed lifestyle. And right. honestly, all of preaching and teaching from pastors all around the world, all around the country, is trying to faithfully expose what the book actually means when it says what it says. Right. Um, because it translations, there's variants and stuff like that, but we've pretty much settled on what it actually says. Have you know, we, though? It, it's, it, <laughs> right. And so that that's a point in of itself because there's tons, tons, I say tons, probably mm, hundreds of translations of Scripture, mm-hmm. you know, but in terms of what the manuscript said and their original whatever in, in Greek and Hebrew, that's pretty much set in stone. You'd need the best linguist in the world to sit there and validate every you know dot and iota of that mm-hmm. when you're transcribing it, which 
pastors learn Greek and Hebrew to an extent, but it's just kind of a formality to them. Right. Um, sometimes it's more than that. Hopefully you do it faithfully. But um, getting back on it, it's just there's very little debate about what the word for word translation is. You know, people have different preferences, but I think what you're getting at is people interpret the book and what the book says very, very, very differently oh, yeah. when it comes to how um, men and women should act together, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to dating and sexuality mm-hmm. um, and marriage. There's some things that um, it's pretty firm on, but there's some things, especially when it comes to um, the LGBT community, not that it's exclusively allowing it, but it's um, it's not as concrete or as frequent of a prohibition as people would lead it on to be. Mm -hmm. Because there's only six explicit references of homosexuality in the Old and New Testament combined. Right. And I think at least two or three of those come in a place where the dude is straight up listing off different sins. And so it's put into the context of lying, stealing, murder, adultery, um, just anger, Mm -hmm. bitterness, maliciousness, and strife, those types of things where it's not as if it's this certain elevated sin put in this own little ivory tower, which people love to do because Mm -hmm. it's just such a political um, sin or issue as well. But it's, it's how people interpret those words and kind of make a couple of words say a heck of a lot more than, what than they, they than they say. do. And there's actually, I mean, I'm gonna nerd out here for a second. There's there's scripture legitimately saying, hey, don't rip this out of context and don't teach anything besides this. Otherwise, you're gonna get eternally punished because you don't mess with the book. Mm-hmm. You know. I thought. Well, my million dollar question is like all those references to homosexuality. Um, there's. I've come out like most people that I know of go by the King James version of the Bible, and here, mm-hmm. here's here's the problem I see with that is you have the original text, the the original Greek and and Hebrew, which was then um, translated into Latin, then translated into English. In so German and English, yeah. exactly. So when when you're reading the King James version, you're what you're reading is a translation of a translation edited by some king from yeah. long ago, and what I'm wondering is, you know, what did what did King James alter about it? What was lost in the translation? So that's why I question any any of those references to homosexuality and whatnot. If though, if that was actually what was said, mm-hmm. um, and I I would wager probably not what it said. Right, and it's worth noting that Jesus himself never said a lick about it. Exactly. It's it's, um, it's in the original mosaic law twice because they repeat it in the old testament Mm -hmm. and then paul mentions it twice maybe three times um and then one's probably scattered somewhere that i can't ring a bell but jesus i'm i know just because it's been established he never talked about Mm -hmm. it at all he talked about infidelity with marriage he talked about divorce but he never mentioned anything about um homo uh, oh gosh homosexuality certainly never talked about um premarital sex right my exclusively my absolute I shouldn't say favorite. See, when I say my absolute favorite thing, that's loaded with sarcasm. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Least favorite thing. Yeah. Is how much Christianity as a whole, and uh, especially Catholicism, has actually ripped off from the pagan community. Okay. Um, And how much uh, they... They've kind of come in and ruined the party for everyone, so to speak. Uh, (laughs) We do that. (laughs) Yeah, before Christianity came along, like, homosexuality was, you know, nobody cared. Yeah. Yeah, it was... was it was a thing. Um, and then Christianity came along and, and turned it into a sense of sin. Um, but uh, one of my favorite examples to give of this sense of Christianity, like ripping off things, is uh, in in the Celtic um, tradition, there is a goddess named Brigid, and she is the goddess of the hearth and the coming spring and all, all this other stuff. And the, the, the Christians that rolled in couldn't get rid of her. Yeah. So they turned her into St. Bridget. They canonized a goddess because <laughs> oh, uh, they couldn't get rid of her. Um, a lot of uh, Christian holidays, if you, you yep. know, if you lay out a Christian calendar and compare it to a, a pagan one, there's, there's a lot of um, interesting similarities. similarities. Yeah. yeah, so a lot of times what, the, what Christians would come in and do is take uh, existing folk holidays and traditions right. Um, make it about Christianity so that it, it was a middle ground. Mm-hmm. 
my favorite is Christmas. That was derived yep, from <laughs> Yule and Saturnalia. Those came first, and then Christians came in and took over it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think of all of the holidays, I would say Halloween is the most truly, um, still purely pagan yeah. uh, holiday that we celebrate. Um, with All Saints Day conveniently. <laughs> with All Saints Day just conveniently shoved in there. Uh, I also want to note with Catholicism, uh, I've noticed uh, they essentially have an altar. They, and, and no, you know, don't you think it's a little weird uh, drinking the blood and body of Christ and uh, exercising demons and stuff like that? Like a lot, like a lot of the stuff that they do came from pagan practices mm -hmm. um, that was then adopted for for the message. Yeah. Right. And so in terms of the cultural symbols, I think you're right on the ball, and I'm not sure there's any discrepancy with that. I mm -hmm. will contest with you on the altar because the Jews, before any pagan, they certainly sacrificed to pagan gods, and that's half the reason God was... Well, it's was, not, it's not sacrifice. Right, right, right. But with, but with the altar and with, and with drinking the blood and the, and the communion, uh, mm -hmm. the bread and the wine, that's exclusively coming from a Jewish heritage. They had the Passover and, and the right. um, bread and... Yeah, all that story with Moses and Egypt. Yeah, and, and apparently stuff. Easter is a derivative of Passover. To um, my understanding. Yes. Like Easter is this weird melting pot of like it was from Passover and then you have like a Germanic thing going mm -hmm. in there and plus right. like seriously, I'm pretty sure Christianity did not come up with rabbits laying eggs. I'm sorry. No, uh, that was I that's got a fertility. Honestly, symbol. no idea where that came from. Um, <laughs> but so. right, and they certainly took a lot from Jewish culture because yeah. they, they took their book right and they mm -hmm. just kind of added to it. Um, which, I mean, if you it believe happens. the story, right, if you believe the story, you're like, well, yeah, you see why they did that, because the mm -hmm. dude came back from the dead and all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But if you don't believe it, I understand completely why that cultural appropriation is frustrating, mm -hmm. but it still happens today, and I'll try to explain this softly, and it maybe doesn't seem I mean, seem you're not going to offend me. I'm right, not, right, yeah. <laughs> right. I'm not going to offend you. What am I talking about? Um <laughs> Because you think about, well, you think about general cultural appropriation, where you take something that's not inherently yours, you remix it, you revamp it, you make it your own, but the original creator, um, seeing it stripped out of its original context, says, what the heck? Mm -hmm. um, hip hop music is a fantastic example, mm -hmm. because that started as a predominantly um, African American um, culture, um, just started with DJ Cool Herc and kind of moved its way through the 80s, the 90s right. into what it is now. Eminem, because um, I love talking about Eminem. He's, he's an just, interesting character. He's, he is, but he was the Elvis for hip hop. So whereas, oh. whereas Elvis took jazz music that was predominantly African American and made it white and mainstream, yeah. Eminem did that for hip hop. Oh, I, I actually did not and know And so that. while there was gangster rap and while there was all that stuff in the 90s, people worshiping Tupac and N.W.A., mm -hmm. it was still primarily um, Africanized and Afrocentric, whereas once Eminem came along and they realized, oh my gosh, a white person can do this and really do it well, a lot mm -hmm. of people would say he's the GOAT, you know, which pisses some people off. <laughs> um, but yeah, exactly. And you can see why, because it's like, man, if this, is, if this started out as a... Um, purely Afrocentric sport and style of music, mm -hmm. then why is the white kid coming along and taking it and making a billion dollars off of it and winning Grammys all of a sudden, getting this yeah. recognition? So it's that same thing, and hip hop is now also driven from secular into Christian. There's Christian hip hop, which is purely niche and kind of made possible because of so many other factors. The fact that we're now digital, and right. it's, it's a lot easier to make music in general. So you've, you're seeing all these different genres pop up. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, it's just an example of um, the culture being appropriated um, and people being frustrated, but ultimately what harm is being done is my main question. Yeah. You know, because there's certainly where, oh wow, the Christians, you know, and especially the Catholic Church, sorry Catholic people, love you, the, the Crusades were a thing, right? And Oh yeah, like and it's, you, if you And you think you don't bring stuff back from the yeah. Crusades, like you bring back culture, you bring back the jewels, and, the, and even in the Old Testament, whenever the Israelites conquered people in Canaan, God said a couple times he said leave the stuff alone, but a lot of times he said, yeah, take their stuff, so. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you wanna go through and, you know, join the par the pagan party and, and you know make your own religions that's fine um i just kind of wish there wasn't mass slaughter over it uh that that's kind of my thing <laughs> right and so we've been really bad about that i think most decent christians admit that but it's also we're you know the thing where you're looking in the past as opposed mm -hmm. to the present there's still plenty of garbage that we do in the present let's not discount that for a second oh, um yeah. <laughs> but it's but it's very hard to make amends and kind of retrogressively 
kind of adopt a correction to mm -hmm. all the stuff that we've appropriated because the list is running extremely long. Right. You know, and it's just, in my mind, not practical. And I hope that's not ignorant saying that to, to revamp. And I think a lot of it is just the the traditions of the church, the, the orthodoxy of it, the Catholic church, and a lot of initially mainline denominations, mm -hmm. you know, Baptist, uh, Lutheran, Episcopalian, and, and ugh, Anglican, where it's very high churchy, it's kind of fading away. Mm -hmm. And those are a lot of the historically uh, denominations that participated in such cultural appropriation, at least in Europe with the, with the Gaelics and the Celts and the Druids and mm -hmm. going down through the Inquisition and, and a lot of um, I'd say 20th century, 21st century Christianity is, yes, we're appropriating pop culture and everybody wants to make Jesus cool. Yeah. You know, every, everybody wants to make Jesus yeah. desperately cool. So everybody comes in um, and they do that in a myriad of different ways, which are interesting. And there's a whole bunch of pushback from the, the older side of the church saying, mm -hmm. why are you trying to commodify the, the freaking Bible? Because I yeah. mean... Uh, it's it's tough. It's tough. Uh, I completely waters understand to walk. that. Yeah. I I have I struggle with seeing how commodified um, the pa like paganism is and how even witchcraft like how misconstrued and, and commodified that is now. Um, it's it's hard for me to watch because I'm just like, well, now people are you know buying these things and into these things because it looks cool, but still. Um, just kind of stigmatize the actual culture and the actual beliefs and practices. And I think I think a really fantastic step that we can all take here is don't assume if someone says that they're pagan or a witch or whatever. Don't please don't assume that they automatically worship Satan and sacrifice bunnies to him. <laughs> please, I am begging. Oh, like, I mean, some there. I'm not gonna lie. There are some people out there who legitimately worship Satan, and, and that, that's that's their thing. That's whatever. But but don't assume that's their thing. Worship <laughs> Satan if you want. That's okay. <laughs> but don't assume that that's like right. what we do, and that don't assume that's all of us. I mean, hell, even Satanism, um, which <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm let me just say this: whoever called it Satanism did, did not not, not, yeah, think did not think it through because they don't actually worship Satan. They right. use him as a symbol of um, just stick it to the man. Exactly of, of just um, self interest and stuff like that. They right. they use Satan as a symbol, but they don't. Act, they actually don't believe in any deities. They mm -hmm. they don't actively worship him, and they don't go out and sacrifice critters right. to him. You know, like like that's that's not that's not the case at all. So the best thing you can do is go out and learn. Go talk to people and be open to what pagans and and witches and, and all these people have to say. Because you'll be surprised. I promise. We're not all gonna start casting hexes. Casting yeah, casting like, hexes like, no. and spells. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's open it's up the Necronomicon like and see what happens. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's gonna be like crazy people out there oh um, there's crazy christians exactly <laughs> there's like, crazy christians but yeah. don't let those that small minority of crazy people just completely color your image of all of us because mm -hmm. uh, that's well that's what we're all fighting for is individual understanding mm -hmm. which which brings it back a little bit to the labels that we were talking about earlier because yeah. you have the joy and the empowerment of community but also the disempowerment uh, where you lose individuality mm -hmm. and you're now conforming fundamentally your identity to whatever um, abstract structures and notions of ethics, morality that you right. have. That comes from, I mean, religion. I mean, even whatever, whatever religion it is, if it's paganism, if it's Christianity, mm -hmm. um, Judaism, Hinduism, you're, you're kind of a little, little, sorry, losing words. <laughs> You're conforming yourself to um, something you perceive as above yourself, something right. you perceive as beyond yourself, and so there's value in that, and that's how we kind of justify restricting ourselves to, you know, no premarital sex, don't mess around if you're married, don't, you mm -hmm. know, there's, there's certain things that we view as beneficial, and that's why we restrict ourselves, but it's also very, I mean, yeah, it, it is fundamentally limiting, and you have to judge for yourself whether or not the, these limitations that you impose um, via the religion mm -hmm. are beneficial to you overall whether or not the design that is supposedly divine is helpful to humanity. Because you would think that if an all-knowing, all-good God set out a list of rules, these rules weren't meant to hurt you, they were meant to help you. Yeah. You know, he's not, hopefully not, this weird dictatorial sadist in the sky. Yeah, I don't know. I, a lot of the stories in the Old Testament bother me, though, as far as that yeah. idea goes. Which ones? Um... Well, 
I'm going to preface this by saying, like, I don't, oh, for sure. I don't have the whole yes. Bible memorized. Uh, hopefully I can clarify. Closely read right. or whatever. So, like, please correct me if I'm wrong. But, sure. like. I intend to. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I mean, that's really fair. Uh, like, one of. No, but I'm very interested. Like, for example, um, the the Garden of Eden story has okay. always bothered me to no end. And the reason why is because, you know, you set out this beautiful garden. You have Adam and Eve gallivanting around as you do. <laughs> as you um, do. And you put this tree there with, you know, the tree of knowledge, right? And maybe I'm taking this far too literally, but if you didn't want your kiddos to eat from that tree, why did you plant it there in the first place? Mm-hmm. Um, and then why is it that, you know, when they get, when they're naive and they're curious and they want to explore and they go and take from that tree of knowledge and, you know, eat it because like it's there and, you know, apples look delicious, right. you know? Um, why would you punish them yeah. when you you didn't have to put the, like if you're an all powerful God, right. why would you punish them when and you- why would you put the snake there? Yeah, why would you put the snake there? Why would you put the tree there in the first place? Yeah. Like if you didn't like it, then then mm-hmm. you have this power. Why did you do it in the first place? I don't, right. I never understood that. Mm-hmm. And so there is certainly contention mm-hmm. about that story in particular because, yeah. you know, the beginning and the end of the Bible are probably the most contentious because they're the most abstract. You have- Mm-hmm. The story of snakes talking in the middle of a garden where nothing else is here, you know? Right. And you've got Noah's Ark, which is a, a t- touchy one. And then Revelation, nobody mm-hmm. freaking agrees about what Revelation right, actually means. yeah, that's a... Yeah. Oof. But in terms of Adam and Eve, it's been explained to me um, in a couple of different ways, and I'll try to synthesize it as best as I can. Mm-hmm. There are two accounts of Adam and Eve in the garden. There's okay. chapter one and there's chapter two, and they tend to mirror each other, but there are slight differences in the iteration. And chapter three is where... The fall happens when they eat the fruit um, and the the snake comes. Satan comes, um, as Mm -hmm. he's believed to be. And God does explicitly tell Eve, um, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of fruit and of good and evil, lest you die. From from every other tree in the garden you may eat, but do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. And so the transgression is not necessarily eating from the tree because the tree in of itself is evil. It's because... God gave Eve a very explicit command and God's word just rhetorically should mean something, you know, if, right. he, if he's God. Basically, right? you disobeyed your dad. Yes. And so what happens when you disobey dad? You get whoosh, whipped. The, the, right. right. And and so she eats of it. And then more than that, um, depending on how pastors interpret this section differently, but the believed genuine first sin from some people is Adam's rather than Eve's because mm-hmm. especially people who think the guy should be the head of the family and there's a certain headship and a responsibility that comes with being the father figure right. think that you know Eve transgressed against the law but then she also deceived her husband Adam into eating it mm-hmm. and that as he then um, disobeyed the Lord's command that the responsibility fell on him as the head of the first household mm-hmm. to just you know stain the rest of humanity with sin and temptation right um so in terms of why the tree is there and why the snake is there um and there's contention on this too Mm -hmm. but the general idea that i've heard and kind of accepted for myself is that god wants to give people free will so i'm a i'm a big i'm not too big into calvinism i think free will is a thing right um but if you have free will then you still want your kids to listen to you, right? Because yes. if you're just total, you know, total talent, oh gosh, I'm losing words here. I'm so sorry, everybody. Mm-hmm. If you're just a dictator, totalitarian, and you make your kids obey you and you don't give them a choice, then they don't have the choice to love you. Mm-hmm. So you sacrifice the potential um, love and you allow potential hatred and disobedience for the sake of true love. Right. So, you know, love without choice isn't love. You know, there's no consent. There's no reciprocation. And so the general idea that I've heard, even though it's not quite explicitly stated, this is a bunch of pastors extrapolating this information from the story is that, Mm -hmm. you know, if God is so good, he would want to give you the freedom to love him back rather than just contractually obligate you you know, for all of eternity saying, you must love me. You know, there's Mm. a big part of the biblical rhetoric that says, yes, God is God, love God. Mm -hmm. You know, and especially I think um, in the Quran, if you want to go into the Islamic faith, they're very, very big just on um, the argument from authority. God is the only God. He is above all else. And so therefore you 
you worship him. And that's mm-hmm. just the stream, streamlined biblical argument. And I think where Christianity differs, one is just kind of got so many different opinions. Muslim Islam is typically a little bit more canonized. It's the mm-hmm. least adulterated yeah. religion, at least in the mainstream of it. There's radical people everywhere. But in terms of just its youth, it's less adulterated overall. But Christianity and the Hebrew Bible, Bible and its interpretations have changed a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, there's and there's tons of different ones, but I think it, it generally comes back to free will, from my understanding. You know, there's, there's the choice to love and to love God back, as opposed to, yeah, you just love me because you're this machine that I've designed you to love me. Right. That, that's. Does that same sort of logic apply to like when he casted Lucifer out of out of heaven? Because like so, I, I didn't. I never right. understood that one either. Because I thought so. Lucifer he got in trouble for love, like. Not liking humans, right? So or... that's tricky, and I'm just honestly not super knowledgeable about that. But that's I, fair. it's more, it's canon in some place and not others. The mm-hmm. fact that you know Satan fell from heaven, that's stated in scripture because I think, oh, it's somewhere in the New Testament where Jesus sends his disciples out and they come back to him and they say, oh, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky, and he's explaining this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. But that's really the only account you have of that physical thing happening. In terms of explaining the why behind that is, again, extrapolated and canonized from from all these post-biblical authors. Mm -hmm. Um, Because having read the Bible, I don't think I ever got a clear how, when, and why Mm -hmm. behind it. If you want to read Milton's Paradise Lost, you could get an opinion, but... That, that doesn't right, count. Right. <laughs> yeah, you could also read Dante's Inferno, but it's just. Um, yeah, you know, that's where, yeah. isn't that where most people get their notion of hell is Dante's Inferno? Yeah. It's Which a, is kind of. It's disappointing. It. <laughs> part it part it, like it, I'm partly amused by it that you know you're supposed to like take the Bible and that's what you follow, but. So, like, I guess right. that goes to show how amazing Dante's Inferno, like, how amazing <laughs> it is. It's a good, it's a good read. that work was. I have tried to read it. I will say um, it includes a lot of um, uh, yeah. references to a million other things. Uh, we're talking old mythology. Yeah, we're talking, old English, yeah. Yeah, so um, have a computer next to you or get an annotated <laughs> version of it is yeah. my recommendation. Penguin classics. No. <laughs> yeah, they, exactly. With all um, the notes. But I just I always found that so interesting that um, our version of hell came from... Oh, yeah. Unknown. There's a lot of crazy stuff we do. And I think it's just with... I mean, it's the same thing with bad science. You have bad theology mm-hmm. and bad information and misinformation. And it's always a battle for truth and what is canon and what is accepted in the body yeah. of knowledge, you know? It's great. And when it comes to topics as culturally important and as sensitive as religion then the noise and the frustration and the kind of duking it out, so to speak, gets amplified right. all the more. That's honestly part of why I kind of rejected religion because it was just, it was a whole, because in my mind, there's a diff, there there's a difference, though not mutually exclusive, there's yeah. a difference between spirituality and religion. For sure. Um, spirituality, usually I'm just like, if you, if you want to go be spiritual, whatever. Um, religion is very complicated because religion comes with cultural and institutional baggage yeah. that I decided that I did not feel like dealing with. It was mm-hmm. not my thing. Um, and honestly, like, it, women have had a lot of bad, you know, have a very questionable relationship historically with the religious institution. Mm-hmm. Um, even today, the religious institution wants to impose, a, you know, a, lo- a lot of disempowerment to people. Yeah. And I don't want to, I personally don't want to support right. that. Where um, do you think that disempowerment comes from? Or can you give me a couple examples? Because um, I'm thinking I know what you're talking about, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I think just restrictions on um, reproductive rights and okay. sexuality and right. um, just the notion of women being subservient as well yes. um, or being passive, uh, okay. being housewives, just kind of continuing those uh, stereotypes and stuff like that. Um, I, I'm just, I'm not a fan of it. Like if you, if somebody, if a woman wants to go out and be a housewife and be passive, mm-hmm. like... As long as that's her choice, that's fine. But to be told that's what that's the kind of woman you should be is very frustrating to me. Right. Um, and I just I wasn't into that. And I know like um, for a lot of people, it's more about just having a personal relationship with God, yeah. and that's perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. Like you know, all for that, you do you. Um, but I just I personally was not fond of having to deal with the extra institutional baggage that mm. came with that. 
Um, yeah. And that's, I think, the trend um, scientifically, or at least statistically, um, from a group called Barna. They do a lot of just, you know, within the church analysis, they do tons of surveys of young people, old people, what do you like about the church? What do you not like about it? What's mm-hmm. your opinions on um, this, that, and the other thing? And it is a trend with younger people to embrace personal spirituality, Mm -hmm. but reject church. So you'll have a lot of people who are nominally Christian say, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I believe what the book says, but they are not involved in a local church, which for the church as an institution is considered a crisis. And so you have a lot of pastors, a lot of churches framing this as World War III. And if we're we're losing members, if we're losing donors, I mean, Mm -hmm. that's a reality, right? It's not the, the heart and soul of everything, but it is a reality. If we're losing members, if we're losing donors, people who are tithing and giving money to the church, then the church will close its doors and the ministry opportunities kind of cease and fall flat. And they're Mm -hmm. scared that they will not be able to do Christ's work or God's work if they don't have this institution alive, which interests me because I'm really realizing for myself, honestly, is just you don't need as much infrastructure to do what the book says, if that makes sense. Right. I... Oh, I was I was gonna go somewhere with this. Oh, it's okay. Oh boy. Um, I feel like um, religion. I, I when I look at religion, I look at the church and stuff. I can't help but see all the pain and suffering that has been caused in its name. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you obviously have your radical divisions For like sure. the rest borrow. Um, you see some of, you know, gave conversion therapy. Uh, you see yeah. a lot of misinformation that's spread, uh, you know, s- all sorts of repression and stuff, celebration for individuals and differences and preferences. And, you know, looking at historically, looking at the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, and, you know, just I, I can't help but empathize with all all the pain that that has caused. Right. And of course, like, I don't, I don't want to associate with that. Um, and that's just me personally. I know not, not everybody feels that way. And mm-hmm. I know there's people, you know, obviously many people out there who do find community and love and leadership and resources and stuff in the church. And that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, it's just kind of been like my personal experience and thought process of it. Uh, which I, it's, it's harsh to hear, um, but the reality is that, you know, it's okay for you to want to be involved in a church and be a part of it, but just be aware of the fact that it has and still does cause a lot of pain and suffering. And you, I think churches should work to identify those pockets of, um, just Mm -hmm. hardship and address those and i think that's how they can work to repair that relationship and gain members back is if they address that pain yeah it's it's definitely difficult and you're and you're absolutely right that the church has caused so much pain and Mm -hmm. i think the best churches um that i've been to and and witnessed are the ones who know how to apologize for history and the ones that know how to correct themselves in the present and approach things with a different manner having learned from history and all the mistakes that humans have made in the past and um, with i guess the helpful reminder but also the equivocation that um people are the ones doing bad things, you know, yes. and trying not to assign that blame to um, God or Jesus, you know, mm-hmm. trying to keep his name decent right, right. And, and knowing that the institution is not ultimately run um, that you would like it to be by mm-hmm. God, um, should he be out there, it's run by people and people, right, and I think hopefully like most people, even when you're optimistic and you say, oh, we're basically good, you mm-hmm. realize that people are messed up. Yeah, And definitely. so when you put that into its proper context, you start to understand that Yes, with with the backing of religion, with the backing in the in, in the name of God, as you said, that mm-hmm. so many awful things have happened, and it's very easy to amplify. And this isn't dismissing it at all. It's very easy to amplify because it is so centralized as an institution, right. where you're able to put this label, the church, onto a myriad of acts, the Crusades and all this Mm -hmm. cultural appropriation that's going on um, and and conversion therapy and all this blanket bigotry by by sections within the church that are doing stuff. But it goes back to, again, 
individuality, Mm -hmm. knowing the difference between an institution and an individual, and knowing that the institution, while it might claim to represent something higher than itself, ultimately does, in my opinion, a piss poor job of doing so on a regular basis. I, so I I can only speak for myself, obviously. Um, For me personally, I'm not the, I'm not the type of person who believes that the the church should be apologizing, giving reparations until the end of days. I, I'm, I'm not. Right. That's that's not what I think should happen. I, what I think should happen is that one learn from history and know like yeah this this was a thing this is what has happened, um, and at some point you do have to stop apologizing, but the trick is when you stop apologizing you do have to continue to improve and continue mm-hmm. learning and continue to have a healthier mindset with right. things, um, you know because at this point the damage has been done yes. But the trick is to, you know, learn where you went wrong so that moving forward you don't continue to cause that damage. Right. And I think the trick to being a forward-thinking and religious or Christian progressive, even though most people would be like, you can't be a progressive Christian, you know, because they think about it in political terms or, mm. or liberal terms. But you've got to be able, like you said, to know when to stop apologizing to make a difference and start acting on uh, what you say you're going to do, you know, acting as the book says. Um, But I think the danger, and this is a lot more talk than practice, because as soon as you start practicing it, I think it's it's hard, but I think not as hard as it is made out to be, Mm -hmm. because the rhetoric behind it is, and I think it truly is the rhetoric, that you fundamentally cannot be faithful to the book um, Mm -hmm. and continue to embrace... um, homosexual people or LGBT in that entire community Mm -hmm. um, or other faiths or other religions or people that are non-religious. You know, everything is a mission to convert. Everything is a mission to get people on your side. And if they're not on your side, then you have to show them why you're wrong. And I think the churches, again, that do this best, there are people who do not do it this way, for sure, are people who know how to put their agenda aside and say, man, if the book said, love this person, how the heck do I love this person where they're at instead of trying to bring them to where I want them to be. It's almost like dating in a way. You know, you, yeah. you can't go into a relationship trying to fix somebody because you mm-hmm. can't fix people, you know, and if you do, it's... That's actually a really good way of looking at it, yeah. honestly, because I, you know, I'm perfect. I'm, I consider myself a chill person and, you yeah. know, obviously I'm surrounded by, you know, Christian friends and whatnot. I have um, one of my best friends. She's very Christian. She, you know, there's things that I've done and that I engage in that she does not agree mm-hmm. with and she views as sin. Um, but the trick is that, and I personally, um, get worried that she's kind of repressing certain aspects of herself. Um, but the trick is we can set aside those differences. We can certainly talk about them. We have an understanding that we have completely different worldviews and different Mm -hmm. values and stuff like that. But the trick is to set that aside and still love each other for the person that we are. Like I, I still love her for the person that she is and she loves me for the person that I am. And, you know, it's just the ability to, to set that aside. And I think um, a good trick for that is, one, like finding common ground, two, yeah. listening to each other, three, accepting that you're not going to be able to make people see the world your way. Mm-hmm. And the sooner you accept that not everyone's going to be on your side, not everyone's going to look at the world that you, the way you look at and the way you want them to, the sooner you accept that, the better off you'll be yeah. and the more friends you'll have. Exactly. And I think that that is so good and it really comes back to, and it's so cliche to, yeah. you know, to, to say, hey, make more friends, embrace other people, embrace diversity and different mindsets, or at least have mm-hmm. a conversation with people you don't agree with. You know, that's very easy to say rhetorically. Mm-hmm. It's extremely difficult to put into practice because right. Especially now we've created, we've retribalized ourselves in a new digital sphere, which makes it incredibly mm-hmm. easily, uh, incredibly easy, sorry, to be um, segregated into our own little bubble right. where we do not have to go outside of it to, to have community, to have relationship, to have, I mean, very fulfilling friendships and, and love, being loved mm-hmm. and being known, which are great things. Again, it's empowering in that sense, the community's there. But when you are so isolated that you are not learning about people, that you are not going out and seeking relationships with those who do not agree with you, that sets you up for miscommunication, that sets you up for conflict, that sets you up for further division, which when you scale out again and realize there are 7 billion people, I think Mm -hmm. 8 billion now, I'm close approaching to it. it. (laughs) I know, on this freaking floating rock in the middle Mm -hmm. of nowhere, (laughs) then 
then you kind of got to push outside that bubble. Right. The, well, there is a problem with this rhetoric on diversity and just completely loving and embracing each other because there are lines in the sand. Um, yeah. So, like, for example, how, how do you um, love and embrace, you know, a culture that's completely contrary to your own? So, I mean, or obviously... Or that despises your own. Exactly. So how, how do you, you know, have this rhetoric of diversity and love and embracing when you have, com- like when your worldviews are so different that there's just that people will kill you for it. Mm -hmm. Um, And plus there's also some things that aren't acceptable, like, you know, just, I don't know, neo-Nazis as a random example, you know, can, can, is it, is it smart and responsible and good to embrace and love them despite that worldview? Mm. When that worldview involves, you know, you know, targeting the suffering of so many people. So it's like, my, my question is, well, where do you draw those lines? Like, yeah, we should embrace each other and assess our differences and talk to people who are, you know, different from us. But where where does that line sit between, you know, acceptance and what is unacceptable? Mm-hmm. And that I think people are trying to draw those lines now. And they're trying to redraw them. And that's getting very messy. Yeah, it's that's a really good way of phrasing it. It's just getting messy, you know, because you you want to have these demarcations in the sand of okay, you know, let's let's understand where you are, let's understand where I am, and try to have a conversation. But occasionally, that conversation is, man, we don't agree on just about anything, or there's one point of contention that you have that just will never sit right with me, you know, and I'm not sure that I can be your friend or be in relationship with you because of that opinion, which is incredibly unfortunate and I've been blessed to not exactly have that happen with me Mm -hmm. you know but I can imagine you know speaking ethnocentrically here going outside of America where there is even less tolerance for um, differing opinions where the cultures are much more homogenous and anything that deviates from normative is either isolated ostracized or exclusively punished you know I think about the Middle East and this is not to besmirch Islam that it already you know, has been by a ton of people, but Islamic countries where there is just this theocratic and autocratic rule, Mm -hmm. there is so much, I mean, just explicit ostracization for anybody who does not adhere to the book, who does not practice the book the way that, I mean, the caliphate says that you should practice it. Yeah, I mean, the Abrahamic religions have become so widespread and ingrained in so many cultures that... Um, I forget what country it was. I want to say it was somewhere in Europe or Anglo-Saxon, whatever. Only recently re-legalized people who practiced the old religion. Um, And how... And there was also a situation in Greece where, you know, there was a slaughter of... um, During a pagan festival of, you know, honoring the ancient deities that was originally there. And you know, when you have these pagans doing their thing, you know, honoring those ancient deities that, you know, that came from Greece, somebody had the audacity to say, you're not a real Greek. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how far removed can you be to deny your own tradition? And it's, it's so painful to see, like, what was there before the original um, traditions, the original religions, the original ways of living and practices um, that you know, they're criminalized and we're, we've gotten to the point where we have to decriminalize what was there in the first place, you right. know? And, and it's, it's just the, what kind of mental gymnastics do you have to go through to, mm-hmm. to, to think Mental that and way? at this point, political gymnastics, because it's, oh, in, it's incredible yeah. how, I mean, democracy, again, has been empowering and disempowering in that it gives the minority a voice. Um, it still privileges the majority mm-hmm. as, I mean, just it's in the name, yeah. democracy, you know. But when you start making those decisions politically and democratically, the room for shouting, it's there. Mm-hmm. So you have this freedom of expression, but ultimately some points are silenced. I think about it, yeah. I tend to think about it in, strangely in tennis terms because, so you have a scoring system, you know, love 15, 30, 40, game right and so no matter how many points i get in a game say we go to deuce in a game Mm -hmm. you're at 40 i'm at 40 and if it's a no i game the next point wins and you have one more point than i do Mm -hmm. and you win that game my entire 
points for that game, all of the points that I earned, all three of them, it's just three, mm-hmm. are eliminated. Right. You know, like I earned them, but you don't see that reflected in the in the game score at least, which is what mm-hmm. matters in terms of winning the match. Right. And so you can have matches where it's incredibly close, but somebody just knows how to win that one extra point, wins it 6-0 as opposed mm-hmm. to 6-4. Um, and I think that's how democracy works as well, where you have, I mean, 60-40, 55-45, right. where there's a majority, there's a minority, but it's not 90-10, it's not 95-5. You know, occasionally it is, you know, um, mm-hmm. but very, very rarely, you know, especially when we've got this bipartisanship going where it is going. Um, and it's, it's just hard to make decisions. It's hard to do really anything, especially progressively, mm-hmm. because there's always people who think, ah, we don't need that, or that's going to cause something that's troublesome in the future. And it's like, well, maybe. <laughs> don't know till we try, I guess. Yeah. And then sh- is that saying we should try everything? No. Like, no, 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 definitely no. not. <laughs> let's, let's, yeah, let's keep the experiments to a safe minimum, you know. Um, let's, let's have some ethics in this situation. Right. I'm down for free college until I graduate, but I mean, after that, no. <laughs> oh, so see, here's the thing about free college. <laughs> okay. Nothing is truly free. And a lot of people don't understand that. Um, so when people say free healthcare, free college, where did, like free sounds great. You people love free stuff, but it makes me wonder if young people today it's actually stop and think, where does the money come from then? Dun dun dun. Guess where? Your parents. <laughs> taxes. And taxes. So your parents' yeah. taxes. So at that point. It's not a matter of free college and free healthcare. It's a matter of overhauling the tax system. And then it's also a matter of addressing why is college so expensive? Why is healthcare so expensive? Instead of sitting there and asking yourself the question, why is a $2, why is an IV bag that costs $2 to make suddenly $100 when it gets pumped into my vein for whatever reason? Why aren't we asking that question? No, it's it's just easier to slap free healthcare on it and, and go on our merry way. Yeah. You know, nobody is actually looking deeper at the problem. Why are textbooks so expensive? Why is tuition rising well beyond the rate of inflation? Why aren't we asking these questions? You know, people just want a quick and easy fix. And usually those quick and easy fixes are the ones that are most prone to failure. Mm, That's a good word. Yeah, because I think the more, like, because you can throw money at a situation, but you don't quite, again, realize the size and the scope of of the situation. And that Mm -hmm. is much to our detriment when it comes to, Oh, checks written in the billions of dollars. Right, and I absolutely want everyone to have access to education, have access to healthcare, and all these things. Um, but we need to figure out the underlying system and where it's broken before we start trying to pile a new system on top of right. it. Right. You know. And I think a lot of that comes strangely from people wanting God to be found in the government. You know, you you want a source of salvation. You want somebody to come in and fix the the problems for you, whatever mm-hmm. you see them to be. And when the government starts to play God, whether that's, you know, democratically, autocratically, however it starts to play God, things don't work out well. Because, again, it's an institution. It's made by people. It's for the people. But It's flawed. It's flawed because we're sitting in it. You know, and we wonder, wow, why are we so, you know, broken and cracked? It's because we're us, Mm -hmm. you know. And that's beautiful in a way. You can throw that into some tragic rom-com and it's, oh, my gosh, I love you. But it's... It's just the reality of who we are, and the fact that we're constantly surprised. I mean, I'm I'm blown away by just blown away by just the depth of our depravity at times. But just <laughs> yeah. yes, but not the fact that it's there. You know, mm-hmm. whenever I see some oh gosh, god awful report of whatever you know new thing is happening or going south, it's frustrating. But I'm also like. I believe it. It's <laughs> Like, yeah, we would do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it was Einstein who had the quote that said there are two things in the that are infinite, the universe and human stupidity, but I'm not quite sure about the universe. I think so. I think the universe is infinite. Yeah. Sort of. I don't know. That'd maybe, be a comp- yeah. Maybe there's multiverses. Maybe there's an infinite of universes out there. Who knows? Yeah, the concept of infinity in general. I stopped there. Yeah, it breaks your brain, honestly, just like the concept of something never ending. You know, it's very, it's very humbling, I think. Yeah, and I think that's one of the the great things I think that science does, um, 
well is just bring a sense of humility back into the population when it's communicated well. Yeah, when it's communicated correctly. That's why the, you know, the image that everyone sees of the Earth from space yeah. is like the first image. That was <laughs> mo a monumental moment of humility. And that, that actually changed a lot of rhetoric, a lot of mindsets is seeing from a distance this blue marble that we live on. It's like, this is our home and like you, you know you don't see borders you don't yeah. see these divisions you can put it all in a picture frame exactly and and i think i think that's why that picture was so important is that it, it humbled us even if only for a moment and it didn't last <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i read cosmos by carl sagan and i think neil degrasse tyson narrated the show that's mm. now on netflix it might still be on netflix at least it was for a while and i read through cosmos by carl sagan and it was probably one of the most humbling experiences that i've ever um, experience that's redundant I'm sorry but yeah it brought me to a new space of myself or even just looking at what's on the earth and inside of the earth the depths of the ocean oh my mm -hmm. gosh and just the the biomes and the ecosystems places that I'll never get to visit in my life more than likely they'll probably be dead by then <laughs> right right and just the expanse of, I mean, galaxies upon galaxies, the mm -hmm. fact that when you take pictures of stars, sometimes they're stars, sometimes they're legit galaxies, and they're right. just a speck on the lens. They won't even show up in the picture frame because they're small, small. You can't fit them in a pixel mm -hmm. of a picture frame, even on the best lenses sometimes. But it's it brings you back to where we actually are mm -hmm. in comparison to, to the grand scheme of things. you know. And so then you look to your neighbor, you look to other people, and you say man, none of us are, are quite hot enough to, to be what we claim to be. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it definitely cools us down a bit in that respect. I mean, surprisingly, I think we know more about outer space than our own deepest oceans. Yeah, I've heard that. I'm not sure if it's true. Mm -hmm. But um, my guess would be yeah. space is probably deeper than the ocean. But I don't know if that it constitutes the limits of the knowledge well, that I can think, be found inside it. I think the reason why that's like kind of a thing is you know, our oceans contain life and life okay. is so complex yeah. and it constantly surprises us. And it, it's, there's just, you know, new things to discover. Um, whereas in outer space, we, we haven't discovered life yet mm -hmm. in outer space. And I personally think that there's, you know, just looking at the sheer vastness of the universe, I, there's, there's gotta be something else. Even if it's fossilized or whatever, there's gotta be something else out there. I mean, you know, but it is, you know, a scary prospect to think, like, whether we're alone and if we're not alone, and both prospects are equally scary, yeah. I think. That's a good place to end. <laughs> Infinity. Ooh. Ooh. Life, the universe, and everything. Meaning of life is 42. There you go. <laughs> if you've learned That's one thing, everybody, from this podcast, it is that, what, meaning of life is 42? Yeah. Okay. Can you name that reference? Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? A. I have it, yeah, because I knew it was just Guide to Galaxy, but I wasn't sure what came in front of it, so Hitchhiker's, but... Yeah, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay. Good series. Dang. Well, mm -hmm. anything else you had? Last minute rants, thoughts, questions, advice for the peeps? <laughs> uh, college sucks. Love your friends. Appreciate your parents, as long as they weren't terrible people. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I was trying to wrap that up nice and pretty, but I don't. I'm, uh, nice. I don't know. You just... put a nice bow on it. I appreciate it. I try. Yeah, yeah thanks so much for coming on. Well, I appreciate... thank you for having me. I enjoyed yeah. it. Appreciate the convo, as always. <laughs> All right. Well, bye, everybody. We'll see you later. Bye.